Okay. Defense? Yes. Okay. So are we on the record? Yes, we are. Okay. Calling the case of Sanderson versus Paltrow. Attorneys are all present. We're here for some matters outside of the hearing of the jury. Um, I believe the uh, the defendant has now rested. Did you resolve the, the exhibits yesterday? Uh, they need to look at them because we kept going. Do we have the indexes? Um, we do that. Okay, so I'll tell you what we did is um, we pulled a bunch of exhibits, narrowed our index, but you need to go through them, and I wouldn't mind thumbing through theirs really quick, too. So the master copy that goes to the jury is the one that said judge copy, actually. That's the one we worked from last night. Okay. And I think, and there, Mr. Sanderson's address is on a few that we need to black out. So I think that actually needs five more minutes of work. Okay. And but, but I think we're close. And so you're not ready to rest until you receive those exhibits? Uh, until the court receives the exhibits? Yes. Do you but have, again, I think we could stand right there and do one last thumb through. Do you have the list of exhibit numbers for the record? Yes, and I think, did I understand Peter just emailed you that? And, I do have them, I mean I have the list. But I, I always want him to make four hard copies of everything, so, um, and is the plaintiff's counsel on that list, the email you just received from Peter? Uh, yes. So. So I want to make sure there's no funny business here. Um, one of the things that we inserted on a poster would be only demonstrative. Right, and this would be on a little piece of, a regular piece of paper. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there was, there were uh, small versions of any of the poster board stuff that, w that were re received by the court. Okay, and so we may need to strip a couple things off the bottom. Uh, was it clear, for instance, like Mr. Sanderson's history pre-collision medical conditions. Um, was that going back to the jury or it's not going back? No. All right, so we still have five minutes of adjusting to do on that. Okay. Um, a uh, directed verdict may, uh, motion may be made at any time. and Okay. We're, we're ready to do that right now. I don't think it will be affected by the exhibits. All right, great. And just for the record, because I think it'll speed things up if we Sure, Mr. Bueller. Um, I guess mind, whoever's going to make the motion, why don't you go I ahead and proceed? Sit down and just make those, uh, or do, would you like me to stand up? Why don't you come up here so I can? Okay. This one will go first. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. This motion is a motion for directed verdict on Ms. Paltrow's um, claim for attorney's fees. Under Utah Code 78B5825, attorney's fees are only available in Utah where there is an action or defense in bad faith. In civil actions, as you're aware, Your Honor, there's only attorney's fees to a prevailing party if the, co if the court determines that the action or defense was without merit and not brought or asserted in good faith. These are two independent requirements 
they have not been met in this case. As the court's aware, we filed a motion for summary judgment earlier on in the case when Your Honor was not the presiding judge. That was denied based on um, questions that the judge had regarding the uh, press conference that was held. And so what I want to talk about first is the standard for um, the court to utilize in the bad faith statute. It is narrowly drawn and it's not meant to be applied to all prevailing parties in all civil suits. An action or defense is without merit if it is frivolous, if it is of little weight or importance, having no basis in law or fact, or clearly lacks a legal basis for recovery. A finding of bad faith turns on a factual determination of a party's subjective intent. A party acts in bad faith when he brings an action or defense and either lacks an honest belief in the propri propriety of the activities in question, intends to take unconscionable advantage of others, or intends to or has knowledge of the fact that his actions will hinder, delay, or defraud others. So therefore, Your Honor, an unmeritorious action, if, the, if that's how this turned out, and who knows, that's up to the jury, an unmeritorious action may still be in good faith as long as there is an honest belief that it is appropriate and as long as there is no intent to hinder, delay, defraud, or take advantage of the other party. That's what's key in this particular case, Your Honor. As the court's aware, the reason for awarding attorney's fees based on bad faith is to punish the wrongdoer, not to compensate the victim. And that fee should therefore only be awarded upon specific evidence of bad faith. There is no specific evidence. There is no evidence of bad faith in this case. This is clearly a he said, she said ski accident. We've heard the testimony of witnesses, of eyewitnesses. Mr. Sanderson had an independent witness that saw the accident. There were also experts who have testified that because of the location of his ribs, rib injuries, that he had to have been struck from behind by Ms. Paltrow. There's clearly, and obviously the defense has their own side of the story, but there is clearly a evidence-based um, support for his claims in this case. Further, his damages. The damages are clear. There's no dispute that he sustained four broken ribs. And then, obviously, there's the claims for the brain injury. Yesterday, uh, there was a great deal of medical testimony that was brought by the defense. M they all agreed that Mr. Sanderson was not malingering. So he is not you know, fraudulently or um, lying about his injuries in whatsoever. Ms. Paltrow, from the very beginning, has brought this claim for bad faith at, and attorney's fees as a weapon to try and compel Mr. Sanderson to dismiss this case. As I said, the summary judgment was denied because of this allegation, this loose allegation that, well, there was a press conference. So we've now heard from the defense. There has been nothing, no evidence brought forth by the defense that the press conference was um, brought to take advantage of Ms. Paltrow's celebrity or that it was in bad faith. In fact, the only evidence regarding the press conference was brought through my questioning of Mr. Sanderson, and he testified that it was his personal injury counsel that held the press conference, that it was their idea, and that the purpose of that press conference was to seek to find witnesses to the accident. So the, there was a motion in limine that sought to exclude uh, evidence that uh, related or I don't know, I don't remember what the motion sought, but the result of it was an order from the court saying that evidence that relates solely to the bad faith claim isn't part of the jury trial. And so the court was contemplating that there would be, that, the, that if the uh, jury found for the defendant, that the court would take additional evidence on the bad faith issues or those that related solely to the bad faith. Um, was that your understanding as well? And, and what do you think, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, Your Honor, that there's been sufficient evidence that has come through this, in through the trial, that there is no evidence of bad faith. There, 
it's a very, very high standard to meet. And there's, there's so much evidence here that shows it is clearly a he said, she said case. This was not based on Mr. Sanderson trying to have an ill motive. Um, and there's a great deal of case law that I could go into, but I don't want to take the court's time right now on that. Um, I, I just, I think that the evidence that has been presented has been very clear that there is no bad faith in this case, that they could not prevail on that. And at this point, I really think that a directed verdict on the attorney's fees would be appropriate. Okay, thank you. Mr. Owens? Do you have, well, first of all, I had two questions. Do you have more evidence, other than what came in here today, to support a bad faith claim? And number two, um, isn't the fact that your directed verdict motion was denied evidence that there is a basis for the plaintiff's claims? Yes and yes. Okay. I was precluded from talking about this stuff by their motion, so I can't be handcuffed and then slapped. Uh, I need to be able to defend a claim. I specifically wanted to talk about this stuff, but based on Kristen's motion, I couldn't. And now I shouldn't be slapped down about it. So I would, I would uh, take the motion under advisement, Ms. Orman. Um, I'd like to hear what additional evidence the defense has on the issue. Um, Your, may I ask when you anticipate doing that? Uh, At a later see. date, or would that is that today? At a later date. Okay. Well, I guess it depends. I mean, if uh, not today. <laughs> when the verdict comes in, then we can make a decision about when to hear the additional evidence. That's fine. I, I remember raising this issue and said, Your Honor, did you envision then I remember that. a later hearing right. at a time convenient to the parties? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Bueller. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, on the issue of spoliation, there's a jury instruction. Um, and we believe there's been no shred of evidence presented in this case that the plaintiff had a GoPro video. He, he denied he had a GoPro video. The only evidence is an email from his daughter who says, oh, I can't believe there, there's a GoPro. And uh, the testimony of the daughter as well, Shay. Yeah, that's who I'm referring But that doesn't mean, I mean, it could be anyone that had the GoPro video, could have been the the Deer Valley could have been anyone, but there's just absolutely no evidence. It was a mistake, and uh, it would be absolutely erroneous if the court gives this jury instruction, other, um, because other than that mention in that email, which uh, uh, the defense, and there's been no evidence at, at all brought in this case that there's anything to it, um, is uh, would be uh, clearly erroneous, and uh, therefore, um, we request that the uh, spoliation issue be stricken from uh, the, the instructions as it would prejudice the plaintiff uh, on something that has no basis, it has not been proven, they, they have nothing. In fact, uh, the uh, late produced uh, uh, meetup.com uh, comments verify that because the defense had been saying or implying or insinuating that oh, the GoPro video must be in that stuff because it was mentioned in that same email chain with the daughter, Shay, and there's just nothing there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to deny the directed verdict motion on the spoliation instruction. The defense, uh, have you reviewed the instruction? There's a new one that came out yes. moving the word, removing the word the from the bottom. It's acceptable. Okay. And... Uh, Mr. Bueller, um, I mean, you're certainly welcome to, to, to submit a request to the court um, some additional interrogatories so that it's clear from the record whether the jury made findings under spoliation or not. Um, it, I think it could track the uh, instruction itself. That way, um, if there's a, a, a verdict that's adverse to your client, you would know whether the spoliation instruction whether, whether there was any uh, inference taken by the jury on the GoPro video. Yeah, it gives more credence to the, uh, to the lack of evidence of this. Uh, so it's, uh, we'll consider that, and uh, I guess we would have to do that pretty darn quick. Yes, we would. I think, I think that uh, the, the daughter, Shay, testified that when she got off the phone, she thought there was a GoPro video, and I think reasonable inference from that the jury could, 
could decide that there was a GoPro video and that your client had some control over that video. Um, they could make that decision. Right, but it, it, there was no evidence that he had control over it. It was just, there was one, it was mentioned, and uh, uh, it means that every time so, a piece of evidence that's mentioned that turns out to not have any basis, then it becomes a spoliation issue. I, we think that's uh, uh, an erroneous level okay. of proof. Um, I've got uh, two others, uh, or actually, uh, and then finally, I'll, uh, do you mind if I go ahead now, Your Honor? On the go ahead, please. Okay. On the issue of negligence, and I'm going to talk about both defendant's negligence and plaintiff's negligence. Uh, on defendant's neg negligence, uh, at least for the record, um, we assert that there is, uh, there should be a directed verdict on uh, liability, causation, and uh, damages, and that, uh, is, that is based on the, the evidence that's been brought before the court. Um, likewise, on the plaintiff's side, we, uh, on the defendant's side, uh, we should have a directed verdict in favor of the plaintiff. On the plaintiff's side, the uh, charges from the defense against the plaintiff on the issues of liability, causation, and damages uh, should also be brought. and. Uh, I could summarize the whole case, but I don't think it's necessary. I think the court realizes that. But if you'd like, I could add more detail for the basis of that directed verdict motion. Uh, two of them. Are we talking about the one dollar? Yes, the one dollar that um, we would owe you. That's the uh, second one. The first one is uh, a directed verdict in, uh, in our favor for our damages, or liability, causation, and. Uh, the only issue would be the amount of the damages for us. So I, I combined them too, so it's actually two directed verdicts with three subparts each, liability, causation, and damages. And I have given it some thought anticipating your motion, um, and and based on my, my review of the evidence, I would deny uh, all, both motions with all three parts in both motions. Okay, thank you, Arnold. Then I have one other, it's not a directed verdict motion, but it's a, it's a motion, um, uh, to take judicial notice of Terry Sanderson's life expectancy according to the um, uh, Social Security Administration uh, life expectancy tables and calculation. This is something that's commonly done. Uh, I'll just advise the defense that we're planning to use in our closing reference to the life expectancy of Terry to calculate a per diem. Have you, have you disclosed to them what number that you plan to use? Uh, yes, I, I'm ready to do that right now. It's, you know, they, they change with each day. Right. And, uh, and I've got one for the court, too. In principle, does the defense have any issue with that? Well, he's got 20 some odd health conditions, some of which are uh, impact life expectancy. So I, I am problem, but I have some problems about it, but I, it'd be nice to know what they want. Yeah, uh, we're actually going to go lower than that. Uh, would you like to approach? Sure. Ten additional years? Yeah, just ten years, even though it says 10.8. Uh, it could be argued that Terry's uh, you know, he's a non-smoker. Uh, you know, uh, he has other health factors in his favor that he's uh, conscious about his health, and so uh, we just want to, in argument, in closing argument, mentioned that uh, uh, he has a potential life expectancy of this and then argue that uh, on a per diem basis for his future non-economic damages. Non-economic damages, as you know, are not precisely uh, derived. They have, uh, it's more of a uh, subjective viewpoint of the jury and the, and the party's arguments in, in favor of to address the defendant's uh, issues with, you know, the the uh, comorbidities, let's call them. They can argue um, that, too. They, I, they I realize they can argue that, but how about to address that if what the court takes judicial notice of is that a person who is 76 years old has an approximate life expectancy based on the Social Security tables of 10 additional years? Yes. Um, is that, Your Honor. Um, that way I'm not, I'm not taking judicial notice of the plaintiff's life expectancy, but rather what the Social Security tables say. Right, Your Honor. 
and or I'll uh, give you a five uh, uh, here, uh, as it relates to let Terry. Me, let me, I, I know what they are, Council. Let me just say this. I don't plan to, or we don't plan to reference this, the Social Security tables. Uh, it would be just a simple that uh, statement that Terry's life expectancy could be calculated at approximately 10 years. And uh, the past seven years since the trial date, I mean, it's like taking cognizance and of the- how do I make that conclusion because it involves an individual? Oh, you don't have to make the conclusion. I'm just- mo You just laid it out, I would. Well, I, what I'm, as, I don't, I'm just uh, previewing what the closing argument will mention and that it's not, and it's not evidence in the case, it's argument. If, it's, if I'm taking judicial notice of it, it is evidence. Well, uh, I, I don't think the court needs to take judicial notice, but if the, the court would like that, we, we did produce this. I'm just letting, giving you a preview in the defense counsel that we will be making this argument that uh, he could potentially have 10 years of life and that uh, that's the basis for our damage claim and then it's, it, we're not raising it to the level of something evidentiary. It's, it's pure argument uh, for calculating uh, non-economic damages. Okay. Mr. Owens? I don't, I don't have an objection to your honor's uh, approach, which is under Social Security tables, a 76-year-old man is expected to live 10 more years. And Mr. Bueller pro is proposing that that not what happened, well, but yeah, they, I, that they just refer to it in closing argument. I mean, yes. not, that they don't refer to any particular uh, table, but they just say, you know, a man at his age, he's probably got about 10 years. Do you have any objection to that? Mm -hmm. And it's argument. But if the court is inclined to not pro prohibit the plaintiff from making that argument, then we would ask that the court take judicial notice of what I just gave you. Okay. Uh, they they can argue it. They can yeah. argue it. Okay, so you can argue it without any reference to the table or me taking any judicial notice. Unless, unless council wants reference to it or the court does. I want to. If you're going to talk about Terry, I'll stipulate to five. No problem. Okay, then just we'll keep it as argument. Okay, it, which which brings up a very important point I wanted to raise. Um, there have been a lot of evidentiary objections during the trial that. Uh, that, that a particular question misstates test prior testimony in the case. Um, I don't want, what I want to avoid is a lot of that kind of objection happening during closing argument that, hey, he's, say, he's not saying what really happened here in trial or he's misstating what really happened here in trial. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I would not, I, I don't want to see a lot of that objection during closing arguments because my reaction will be the same as it has been throughout the trial the jury will remember what people said. So if you think that the other lawyer uh, or lawyers say things that aren't supported in the record, then bring that up in your part of the argument. Uh, Fair enough, Your Honor. And, uh, and, and so what, because what I expect you to do with this one exception of this 10-year thing, um, I expect you to tether your arguments to the evidence that was in front of the jury and any reasonable inferences from them not to bring in outside data, not to bring in outside uh, evidence, but just the evidence that was here in this courtroom. Okay? Uh, yes. Just to, uh, to give you a sample, we would argue that Terry has approximately 10 years left, at, uh, at least in his life. He's uh, lived a healthy, he's, uh, act, he's not, a non, you know, non-smoker. No objection. And there's not any objection to that? Thank you. Okay. Turning now to the jury instructions, does anyone wish to object to any of the closing jury instructions that the court put together? We're reviewing them. Uh, I know you gave them to us yesterday. Uh, give us one moment, please. The only one that we might have a uh, small uh, suggested change or objection to, Your Honor, is the spoliation. Can you speak up? Sorry, it's the spoliation. Uh, instruction that we have here. Okay. It's that first sentence. Uh, we don't believe that there's been any evidence that Mr. Sanderson was in possession of a GoPro, and so we would want the first sentence to be changed to Miss Paltrow has presented evidence that a GoPro uh, video of the colli ski collision may have existed. <coughs> Sanderson asserts that the GoPro video of the ski collision never existed. So it would be because there's been no evidence put on that he possessed it. There's been 
inference of that maybe at best, but it's again coming through his daughter's email to him. I think that's a reasonable request. Because there's no there's been no evidence of his possession. It's more neutral, no. I think. So it would read now. Ms. Paltrow has presented evidence that a GoPro video of the ski collision may have existed, period, and everything else remains the same. Yeah. Okay. Any other objections from the plaintiff to the jury instructions? No, Your Honor, as we looked through them yesterday, we were at that point. Okay. How about the defense? Your Honor, one thing I noted on the violation of a safety law instruction, the last sentence reads, if you decide that Mr. Sanderson and or Ms. Paltrow did not violate the safety law, you must disregard the violation. And I'm th thinking maybe that should read safety law because in the yes. prior clause, there's no violation. Thank you. That's correct. And then I did not include the inherent risk of skiing that the defendant requested. Um, is that one that you're, are you dropping that request or would no. you like me to give my reasoning why? We want it and we would like your reasoning. Okay, here's my reasoning. So the defendants have requested a, a jury instruction that was entitled the inherent risk of skiing. And they were basing that on Utah code 78B-4-401 and what follows as well as the Donovan versus Sutton case. And so the courts reviewed those very carefully. Um, a plaintiff asserting that a statute, and they're assert, basically they're asserting that this statute provides support for the applicable standard of care um, or that relates to the standard of care in a tort claim. And if, if a party is planning or is asserting that, they must demonstrate that the purpose of the statute was to protect a class of persons of which uh, the plaintiff in this case is a member. Um, or, or the parties in this case are a member and to protect them against injury or death resulting from the kind of harm contemplated by the legislature. And that comes from the Colosimo versus Gateway uh, case. Further, a plaintiff must show that the law was intended to protect persons in the plaintiff's or the defendant's shoes from the type of harm that befell them. So the Utah Code 78B-4-401 um, the Inherent Risks of Skiing Act is not a safety statute as, uh, is, is, as is anticipated to be read through a jury instruction, but a limitation of liability statute in which the persons protected are ski area operators, not skiers. The act is not affording any protection to the skiers against, in, against in, injury, which is the type of harm at issue here. So looking specifically at this instruction as it has been uh, submitted to the court, the court believes that this inherent risk of skiing proposal, uh, this jury instruction proposal, circumvents the proper application of the elements of a cause of action for negligence to the extent it allows the jury to reach a result without following the principles set out in the usual negligence instruction. It also creates a substantial potential for confusing and misleading the jury. A jury could rely on a more general understanding of inherent risk of skiing and that it is simply an unfortunate and unavoidable injury causing event for which there is no responsibility, even though under traditional tort concepts the accident was caused by negligence. Compounding this confusion is the implication that the inherent risk of skiing constitutes a second ground of non-liability. An instruction carries a substantial risk, this instruction carries a substantial risk of diverting the attention of the jury from the primary issue of negligence and, as a and has a significant chance of creating the impression in the minds of the jurors of a second hurdle that the plaintiff must overcome if he is to prevail. This instruction cr uh, creates a spurious additional issue in the case when in fact the sole issue is the presence or absence of negligence approximately causing the accident. The jury is faced with co complex, conflicting, and less than compelling evidence and the imprecise rules of causation and comparative fault create a significant temptation 
to abandon a rigorous application of the negligent of the instruction and the elements of negligence and the burden of proof and return a verdict based on the simple notion that an accident was an inherent risk of skiing or somehow unavoidable. Apart from the inherent confusion, the instruction tends to reemphasize the defendant's theory of the case that the defendant was not negligent. To that extent, the instruction then constitutes an inappropriate judicial comment on the evidence. Of course, there are collisions caused by the inherent risk of skiing for which the defendant or defendants are not negligent. In such cases, if supported by the evidence, the defendant can certainly argue that they were not negligent and that the accident was the result of the, an inherent risk of skiing. And I think this that would be appropriate argument in this case. So defense can certainly argue inherent risk of skiing. There's been evidence of inherent risk of skiing. They can argue that neither party was negligent and this was purely an accident um, and that neither party was negligent. But in terms of the court reading the instruction, those would be the reasons why I declined to do so. Your Honor, I, I actually misspoke earlier. I think I've got one thing that I just noticed um, to other instructions, if we're ready to move on. Sure. Um, on jury instruction, uh, page 16, mitigation of damages, uh, I believe the second sentence, uh, it says, any damages awarded should not include those that could have, and I think, been avoided needs to be <coughs> added in there. Thank you. Thank you. Does the, do the defendant have any other exceptions they want to take to the jury instructions? Thanks. We yesterday. Are you okay if I sit here? Sure. Uh, yesterday, Your Honor granted a directed verdict on behalf of the defendant on the issue of a post-collision hit and run. Help me if I'm missing something. But we previously uh, provided to the court defendant's proposed instruction 45, entitled Gwyneth Paltrow did not hit and run and flee the scene. I have a copy. It's marked up if you want it. I've got it here. Your Honor, I, I think the uh, denial of the directed verdict um, it doesn't use the word hit and run. And what we talked about yesterday was post impact or post crash conduct um, is still relevant to the, uh, yeah, the failure to render aid portion of the ordinance is still being read. It's the failure to give a phone uh, address and uh, contact information that was that was directed out. So if you have an instruction that relates to that, I'd, I'd be glad to consider yeah. that. Then it also included Dr. Goldstein's testimony. That was also the basis to demonstrate the, uh, uh, the uh, availability of the post crash. Uh, actions or events. So do you have, so, a, do you have yeah, another instruction I, that's more closely tailored? I think the first sentence of the two sentences. So your honor chose to split the issue and, uh, and this is the heading. So the first sentence is what we want. I have already determined that Gwyneth Paltrow did not hit and run and acted uh, Maybe that's the extent of it. Your Honor, I think that's inappropriate. It's, it's preloading an issue that what isn't an issue. Uh, it's not something that we're asserting. And that there's um, the motion in limine stands for. And uh, we think that you know we could put in a lot of things on both sides that are at this stage uh, irrelevant and distracting. And there's been prejudicial. There's been evidence as well as arg argument, well, opening statement and uh, cross-examination implying that uh, the defendant left the scene without giving in violation of some ordinance or some uh, requirement that she give her contact information. So I, what I could read is that I have already determined that Gwyneth Paltrow did not leave the scene of the accident without giving her contact information. Thank you. That's reasonable, Your Honor. Okay. 
any other uh, from the defendant any other exceptions yes your honor and you, you did rule on this so I don't want to irritate you uh, but Deer Valley's resorts dismissal I, I do like the words for no payment and this was previously argued I'm rendering an objection uh, I okay. always get a kick out of this idea. It's so obvious we don't have to say it. Well, then why don't we just say it? It's, that's noted. I mean, the instructions already been read. It's in the opening instructions. Any others? Uh, Your Honor, I've had a lot of paper thrown at me. Is the uh, oral argument is the, excuse me, jury instruction that says uh, if you find that there was no negligence, you can disregard the remaining damages at, uh, instructions? There, you'll see that when we get to the special verdict form. It's incorporated into the special verdict form. It, it indicates that if you find no negligence on the part of either party, you sign and date the form and turn it into the court. So I think in the opening instructions, it said something to that effect. Uh, there is a standard Muji that says, I'm now going to instruct you on damages. If you find that there's no negligence, you should disregard these instructions. OK, yeah, that looks like it's on the introduction to tort damages page. I think it's 12 or 13 in your packet. Thank you. No okay. other comments. Okay. Turning to the special verdict form, I realize you just got my version of it. Um, have you had a chance to decide whether this meets your needs? I, your Honor, uh, I took this from the Florida claim counterclaim verdict form. I took the, the concepts here. Your Honor. I Oh, you printed it. Sorry, I was looking on my email. I see. Thank you. Did you get that, Mr. Bueller? Yes, we did. And we're just wondering if uh, before closing argument we could get another copy because two counsel, I think. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to, there's, there's one change that I think I, I might need to address with you whenever you're ready. Uh, and then we'll have to print out new copies. This is a second exact copy. Thank you, Johnny. I mean, we can wait to look at this until uh, we just before reading jury instruction, because I would like to read this to the jury during that part of things. If you're not quite ready. Uh, can we tie in two minutes? Sure. The one, I can tell you when you're ready, it's the one change that I see. It's two thirds of the way down on page two. When you go, when you get past, when you get to the bottom of the comparative fault questions, there's that separate section. Um, just, above, just above the damages line, it says, if Terry Sanderson's fault is 50% or more, Rather than proceed to question nine, because that one's already filled in, I suggest that we just say, sign and date the form and turn it into the court.
am I thinking that through right on the comparative fault? If Terry Sanderson's fault is less than 50%, then you answer the damages question. If it's 50% or more, you just sign and date it, and that means that the one dollar that's been assigned to Gwyneth Paltrow is the is the counterclaim. Um, Your Honor. Did um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, if Terry's fault is 50% uh, or more that the defendants uh, doesn't have 50% or more either. <coughs> or, um, you know, stuff happens, inherent risk of skiing, accidents happen. Uh, the jury could deny awarding the $1 to Ms. Paltrow, so. Well, if, if they put 50-50 on the comparative fault questions. Yeah, that, then it would uh, work, then there would but. Be no recovery for either side, right? Right, but th there's the possibility of, uh, um, you know, I guess they'd have to do that exactly, but if there's this other, is that is that what we're thinking, co-counsel? Pete? I, I, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is I think there's enough information in these answers to help us to, to uh, create a judgment based on any scenario of, that they come up with. I think that's acceptable, Your Honor. I think that uh, could change. It seems like that to me, Your Honor, as well, but I just want to make sure that Sometimes one of Sometimes a flow chart's helpful. Yeah, that's yeah. true. One of, it'd be nice if one of the questions or it's important, obviously, that one of the questions allows them to connect Terry Sanderson's fault uh, to the co um, say that it caused Ms. Paltrow's damages. And it, it, do you see that as covered by comparative fault questions? Because number four just asks whether his fault is a cause of his own harm, not of Ms. Paltrow's harm. So I just want to make sure that causation well, I see that. question I see is that. addressed. Should should four read just like two? <laughs> That was my thought, and then the comparative fault questions address whether Terry, Terry Sanderson's uh, fault caused his own harm or to what extent. In other words, if, if a party's fault caused the other party's harm, is that sufficient? Or do we need another question, or does that question need to be modified to say, was a party's fault the cause of their own and the other person's harm? The other party's harm? How would you like that to read? I, I'm fine with it just, you know, with, with us uh, re, redrafting four to read like question two. Right, and then any self-harm is captured by the comparative fault questions. That seems reasonable. That seems reasonable to us, too. Yeah. Okay. So the question four we'll read now, was Terry Sanderson's fault a cause of Gwyneth Paltrow's harm? The title of these um, um, sections, Gwyneth Paltrow questions, um, that, should it be like defendant Gwyneth Paltrow questions or should we eliminate that at all? I'm just posing that as a question because it seems kind of, uh, she's not asking that, we're asking that, and the vice versa. Questions on Gwyneth Paltrow? Yeah, under, above number one, is the title underlined in bold says Gwyneth Paltrow questions. Just take the word questions out. Well, I, I just, um, it makes it sound like one, they're asking it, but it, in reality, we're asking was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault, not Gwyneth Paltrow. So how about if we just label it Gwyneth Paltrow? Right, or, or does it need a title? 
I think it helps direct their attention that we're talking about her, her actions. Right, I, I see that. Yeah. Um, Just eliminate the word questions on each of the headings. Yeah. Let's do that. Because it, it implies that she's asking that, and and I can also delete it on under comparative fault, and we'll just call it comparative fault. Yeah, because I think that makes more sense. May I go to eight and nine just for one moment? Yes. We're nitpicking, but uh, Judge Tom Green used to say, if we don't get this right, we get nothing right. So number eight. Uh, I just, what if we said what amount fairly compensates Terry Sanders for non-economic damages? There's a bullet point that I don't understand. Yeah, I took this off of the plaintiff's form. That's, that's the way the standard Muji does it, but it does it when there are more than one category. True. So yeah, that could simply be added to the, to so it. That, for non and non The only thing I thought damages. about was that it clearly it clearly says non-economic damages, and there is a jury instruction that is entitled that, as well as the, the number nine clearly says economic damage, and there is a jury instruction entitled economic damage. And for the ec economic damages jury instruction, perhaps it should just say uh, Gwyneth Paltrow seeks one dollar. I don't think they need to even need this big instruction on economic damages. What do the plaintiffs want on economic damage? Well, I think, the, I, as the court pointed out, I think we already have the instruction. We've been working on the instructions for a while. We, we like to have it in there, and I think it clearly is indicated here on the special verdict. What I like about it, Mr. Owens, is that it distinguishes the non-economic damage. Okay. And then number nine, I would just say, what amount fairly compensates Gwyneth Paltrow for economic for economic damages, I uh, delete the bullet point and the dot, dot, dot. Okay. Is the plaintiff okay with deleting bullet points and the dot, dot, dots? And the empty space to the right, the blank. This is on dollar nine? On eight, I think it's just this is on, line to This is on right. nine. Eight and nine, just take out the bullet point and the dots. And just include it as part of the sentence. Yeah. And then what's, what's the, this, Business of a blank space? Under where there, I think at number eight, there's a missing line to fill out that line uh, for damages for Terry Sanderson. I'm not following you. You want a blank after the dollar sign? No. What? No, there was just, there's a line underneath. On question nine, it doesn't matter. Agreed. That that line shouldn't be there. I'll do my best. It's very complicated, Your Honor. When I was doing our version last night, their tables are part of it. They are. They're tables. All right. So why don't we take just a short restroom break? Mr. Sykes is now here. Good morning, and then we'll uh, bring the jury in. Your Honor, can I mention one thing? Sure. We filed a pretrial motion on rebuttal witnesses, uh, number 12, defense pretrial 12. It was granted. It sought to give you a little bit of a bench brief on the narrow scope of rebuttal witnesses. In short, they are not to just restate anything that could have been stated in their case in chief. I even had uh, a judge in Logan literally say you can ask like eight questions and then he can say yes or no with one sentence. I mean, and I, I was on and off in about three minutes um, because those were the only brand new issues that they couldn't have pre pre uh, predicted. And uh, so we asked that this rebuttal witness be strictly limited. Um, it's not used as an opportunity for the plaintiff to just uh, restate and sort of get the last word on things that uh, so we talked
talked about this when the motion uh, came up and the court agreed that these are rebuttal witnesses. They're not to strike off in a new territory. They're not to clarify. They're to respond. Correct. They're just to issues that came up in the defendant's case. And then, of course, on the counterclaim. All right. Brand that, new that's issues. all. Basically, three questions, Your Honor. And who's the next witness? It's uh, Richard Bain. We're just waiting for him to get on the Zoom. Okay. While you do that, then we'll take a short recess. Thank you. As long, unless unless it takes longer to get him on the Zoom. Let us let the bailiff know as soon as you get him on the Zoom.
Yeah. Okay, Dr. Bain, can yeah. you hear me? <laughs> I, I'm not instructed to use
may be seated. Are we ready to bring the jury in? Okay. All right. Ready for the jury? Thank you. Roger that. Say, would counsel approach the bench? Uh, I need to show you.
Good morning, members of the jury. Sorry for the delay. Um, just be assured that we've been working very hard, and I think the rest of the morning, as a result, is going to go much smoother and much faster. So, thank you. Mr. Bueller? Uh, Plaintiff Terry Sanderson calls Dr. Richard Bame on rebuttal. Mr. Bame, I'm not sure if you can see me. This is Judge Holmberg speaking. If you could please raise your right hand to be sworn in as a witness. Uh, Governor, I, I do not see you. I just see myself. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do, reporter. Once again, uh, Dr. Bame, if you could state your full name and spell it, please. It's Richard Bain, spelled B-O. Uh, I think that's B-O-E-H-M-E. -E. Can you hear me, Dr. Bain? That's a firm. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. I understand you're on vacation, and we appreciate your time. Uh, Dr. Bain. Yes, I am. Dr. Bain, in trial testimony this week, the defendant's expert, Dr. Irving Schur, disputed your findings regarding the ski collision between Terry Sanderson and Gwyneth Paltrow on February 26, 2016. Have you had a chance to read his trial testimony? Did you say something? Yes, I have. I've read his. Okay. Uh, Doc Losing a few of the words, uh, yes. Um, so uh, maybe, Dr. Bame, if you would uh, start off your uh, speech with something that will then kick in the audio. So it, it, here, so here's my answer, something like that, before you answer. Okay. Uh, Roger that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Schur suggests you, that you made an error in your calculations. How would you respond to his suggestion? Here is my answer. Dr. Scherer mischaracterized my analysis, which led to his analysis being misleading and incorrect. Okay. Uh, could, you ex uh, could you explain that in more detail, what the analysis is that uh, uh, you want to correct? Sure. Well, Dr. Scherer first wrote up the impact force formulas, and he labeled one of them wrong and one of them correct. And both of them are wrong. And why? First of all, the equation F equals one half MD squared over D, where he substituted one half AT squared or one half AT and then AT in the parentheses for velocity. You can't do that without uh, solving for time or T first. Basically what you have from a mathematical standpoint, you have force and time, which you don't know. So you have two unknowns in one equation. So basically the equation is unsolvable. So you have to first solve for time. And uh, you guys have uh, there. So if you go over to the first one where you have x equals x0 plus v0t plus 1 half at, at squared, you have to know the height at which Mr. Sanderson fell to the ground. Dr. Bain, could you share your screen and show us your calculation. Let's see if I can. I, I don't. I hear, and I'm trying to. Have it. Let's pull it up. Go over here. Do you have it? Uh, not, not yet. We'll try to share it here. Um. Let's 
Just give us a second. I'm blur our screen. Just a second. I'm going to show it to you. All right. Okay. All right. I'm I'm just had to unblur my screen. Show it to you, but for my exhibit zero plus v, half at squared for time. So the height at which Sanderson fell, which is x for t, and you can see that less than a four six okay the second are you substitute i'm in for to determine the who are falling falling downward we know what it is because it's earth everywhere on this property is gone oh if you Dr. Bain, we're having trouble hearing you. Um, if you could uh, avoid this, the pauses, it might work better. Hear that? So you see, the one half with a there. Your now, Honor, we're getting about been working, fourth of what he's saying. So this either needs to Dr. be Bain? fixed or stopped. Is our motion? Your Honor, let me just try one last thing. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bain, could you stop your video and then just talk once you've shown the formulas? After, uh, that way the uh, signal might be clearer. Right, IT guy, I will. Now. Sorry, Council, but it doesn't sound like it's going to work. Why don't you just call him on the phone? Phone, phone would work? Yeah. Dr. Bain? Dr. Bain? Sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I hear. Can we call you on your phone? And uh, because we're having technical difficulties with the video and the. Roger that. Okay, uh, should I call your cell number? Uh, on the iPad, if that gives you a... Uh, I don't see that. I've got other numbers for you. Can you... Cell number. Well, I guess he's not. Okay.
have it right along there. And they know what their what their time is that they have left. So Okay. Do you want me to FaceTime or what? No, uh, we're just going to do it by uh, audio. Oh no. Yeah, just uh, you're you're live in court. So that you can the jury can hear you. Roger that. And so, do you have my equations up? Are those the equations? There they are. Okay, Dr. Bain. Sir. We've got your equations up. Okay, so do you have the one, the sheet where it starts off with X equals X0 plus V0T and so on? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so, so as I was saying, uh, should I continue, sir? Yes, please. Roger that. So in order to make the equation work, you have to solve for time, which is T. Make sense to uh, to take your next witness while someone is outside trying to reestablish. Uh, this is our only witness. Okay. And your Honor, may we approach for one moment? I, I'm seeing a potential problem. I guess I could just bring it out while they're calling. I, I was prepared in cross to maybe show Dr. Bames some documents or even draw some things. Um, I don't. I wasn't sure whether I'd get into that, but depending on what I hear, I was going to do that. I know I don't have a ton of time, and maybe I decide not to, but this obviously makes it so I can't do that, which is a problem I think if I decided I think that I wanted to. both parties are going to be hamstrung on this, so why don't we take it as it comes? look at the phone to see if we're still connected but in any event uh once you get the time 0 0.466 seconds that's the time it takes to free fall from a specific height x which is measured on mr sanderson which is three and a half feet to his ribs and then you substitute t into the equation velocity equals one half at squared. In this case, typically for free fall equation, it's v equals at. Now, the reason I put the one half in there with the asterisk, and keep in mind, I've been on this case for two years, and up until this point, no one has ever asked me why that asterisk is there with the one half. Well, keep in mind that those equations are for free fall events. So if you're suspended in the air by X, three and a half feet, and you are dropped to the ground, that's the velocity that you would get. However, we know that Mr. Sanderson is not suspended in the air when he collides or when he makes contact with Ms. Paltrow. So he's actually standing on his skis, so he's standing upright. So when he falls to the ground, it's not a free falling event. And you can appreciate that because when he falls over, the speed of his feet that hit the ground is zero, whereas the velocity of his head is certainly much greater than the velocity at his feet. So you have to know, which I took his measurement in the office, how high the point of interest is, which is his ribs, because that's what he fractured in the collision. 
So once you do that, you substitute the one half at squared asterisk into the, and that turns out to be 2.29 meters per second. And you put that into the impact formula and then you obtain uh, what the impact force is. So the equation should be written FI impact force equals one half um, in parentheses V sub T asterisk all squared and then over D, the distance through which the energy is transferred from the ground to his ribs, which I measured in the office. So you have to know those quantities and understand that this is not a free falling event. So that's the that's the big difference here. And once you have the 2.29 meters per second and you substitute that in and you just use Mr. Sanderson's weight as the mass in that equation, you realize that there is not enough impact force to fracture those ribs. So there has to be a mitigating circumstance i.e. something fell on top of him in addition to him falling to the ground to cause those ribs to fracture in an otherwise healthy male. And so when you do the calculation, the object, and typically to fracture ribs on the lateral side, which is where he fractured his ribs, takes about 4,000 newtons, thereabouts, plus or minus 400 newtons, 4,000 newtons plus or minus 400 newtons to fracture those ribs. And when you work backwards, the mass required to do that indicates that the object that fell on Mr. Sanderson had to weigh at least 100 pounds. So based on what I know about uh, this case, any human that weighs greater than 100 pounds falling on Mr. Sanderson onto his right side fracturing those ribs would qualify as a traumatic event from an impact force calculation standpoint. Now, so once you understand that, then you start to consider other possible scenarios as to is there any other way he could have fractured those ribs? The only other way he could have, if you consider him striking Miss Paltrow from behind is that if he were to do that, he would have to generate a rotational force on him and Miss Paltrow, resulting in him falling on the ground and Miss Paltrow falling on top of him. Okay. Now, keep in mind, as I already calculated, if you look up there, it took less than half a second to fall to the ground. And so for him to ski into Miss Patro and then rotate 180 degrees to the ground in less than a half a second requires a rotation rate of greater than 400 degrees per second. Now, Olympic swimmer, uh, Olympic divers, that is, when they do their twisted and turnings on their competition dives, don't generate any greater than 400 degrees per second on their dive. And then when you take into consideration Newton's first and third laws, you know, Ms. Paltrow is certainly not uh, twisting and turning if she's struck from behind. So in order for her to rotate around with Mr. Sanderson, Mr. Sanderson has to, according to Newton's first and third laws, grab her and then take her to the ground in a twisting fashion where she lands on top of them. Now, Olympic swimmers, if they were to grab a hundred pound, a hundred pound weight or more and try to do those rotations, that's just not going to happen because the center of gravity is too far away from the moment or the inertial point for rotation. So that's probably not going to happen. But let's hypothesize that this did, in fact, happen, which is highly unlikely. If Ms. Paltrow landed on Mr. Sanderson and he landed on his back, that means 
she landed on his chest. And if that were to happen, the ribs would not fracture on the lateral aspect of his chest, as we see in the medical records. So we know, based on that, and the low probability of the rotational or the angular uh, velocity, that did not happen. So that only leaves one possible scenario to satisfy Newtonian physics, the uh, Mr. Sanderson's uh, measurements, and his medical records, and that means that he was struck from behind, went down onto his right side, made contact with the ground, with his elbow, the energy was transferred into his ribs that fractured the ribs. Now, I would like to add that had the rib fractures not occurred, no one would be able to do this analysis, period. And that's all I got to say about it. Thank you. Uh, that's all for me. Uh, Defense counsel, uh, question you next. Roger that. Mr. Egan. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, am I to talk through this? Can you hear me, Dr. Bame? Uh, barely, barely. Is this Mr. Egan? Yes, it's Mr. Egan. Hi, good morning, Mr. Egan. <laughs> good morning. Um, given the uh, limitations we have, I'm not going to ask you some things I prepared. Um, I can't show you a, a number of things. Um, so this may, this may take a second, um, less than we'd, we'd planned here, but let me start this way. Dr. Schur, you, you watched Dr. Schur's or read Dr. Schur's trial testimony, right? Yes, I read it. I did not watch it. And so you didn't see him writing up the equations on the board for the jury and discussing those for them? I I did get a text picture of his equations. Okay. But you, did you get a text picture of the drawings that he, he drew for the jury? Yes, I did. And Dr. Schur has significant experience applying the principles of biomechanics to skiing, correct? Uh, to my knowledge, he does. I, I don't know him personally or professionally. And, and you do not have that kind of experience, correct? Uh, with regards to what, sir? Applying the principles of biomechanics to skiing. Uh, I have not worked on skiing problems, if you will. Uh, okay. But certainly. And Dr. Schur has studied the physics of skiing and ski equipment, correct? Oh, yeah, I, that's my understanding of uh, primarily bindings with skis. Uh, yeah, I think it goes beyond that, but that's that's right. And and you have not you have not done such studies, correct? No, not on ski bindings, sir. And did you learn anything from Dr. Schur's testimony, given his experience with ski, applying biomechanics to skiing, and, and your lack of it? Did you learn anything from him? Did Did I learn anything? I mean, all I learned was that he. He uh, assumed a free fall event, and it's not a free fall event. That's what I learned primarily, and that's why uh, that base, basic assumption uh, flaw is analysis. And you, but you, that's the only thing you learned. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. And that's the only thing you learned. Talking to the yes, that was uh, basically uh, the, the. That's why I'm here today. Um, you know, is this oh, better? Oh, I hear you much. Can you I hear, hear me better, better if I do this? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just, you know, leaning in front of the jury here. <laughs> no, no, I, I appreciate that. I can <laughs> hear you really good now. Five oh, by so, five. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's a first. Okay. So, uh, do you know anything about DIN settings? Those are the settings that dictate when ski bindings release. No, no. Uh, do okay, so, about that. so not, you, not, I, have, I haven't skied in 40 years. Right, okay, and you that, uh, also, that means you wouldn't know how much force it would have taken to release Mr. Sanderson's boots from his skis, correct? I did not calculate that. Not just that you didn't c calculate it, you, you don't even know 
what force it would require. Is that right? No, that is correct. It's not required for my analysis. Okay. Um, Did you catch in Dr. Schur's testimony that he's read the um, voluminous literature on rib fractures and uh, the biomechanics of rib fractures? Uh, I'm sure he has, but uh, we actually we did experiments in the lab in the military doing that. So oh, we're okay, very, but my question was just: Did you see? That. Did you? Uh, see that part of or read that part of his testimony? That's what he uh, uh, portrayed. Okay, and it sounds like you you dispute his reading of that literature? No, uh, I don't. I mean, he portrays that he knows a lot about uh, biomechanics. Sure. I, I don't know. I've never been in a discussion with him to uh, uh, familiarize myself with his level of knowledge in that field. Um. You said earlier that part of Dr. Schur's um, mistake in your mind is that uh, he didn't acknowledge that uh, he didn't solve for T. Is that what you said? Well, that's one of them. The, the okay, so that we just want to stay on that one for a second. Uh, Roger that. Did, did you, did you? Objection, let the witness finish his answer, he, counsel. I, he answered my question. I was just going. Mr. Bame, did you have anything else that you needed to uh, say to respond to the previous answer? Uh, no, we can we can move on, Your Honor. Okay, thanks, Dr. Bame. I don't mean to interrupt. I'm just trying to be quick because I don't have much time. I understand, Mr. Egan. So did did I'm you? In a, I'm in a hurry too. I'm <laughs> trying to make make a luncheon. I got it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you making time during your vacation. So. Um, did, did you miss in Dr. Schur's testimony where he pointed to the pages in, in your equations where you solved for T and he, he just assumed what you had done? Right. I mean, basically, he did an analysis or a critique, I might add, on my analysis. I don't see where he calculated it himself. Right. He was just working off yours, just assuming what you had done and then doing his own calculations. Right. That, that is correct. Okay. Thanks. That's all the questions I have. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Appreciate it. Mr. Bueller. Uh, Dr. Bain? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so you did see the calculations from Dr. Schur. Well, he, I mean, I saw what he did, which was critique my analysis, and that was it. I don't know what I don't know if he did any calculations based on what I saw in his testimony. If you could uh, quickly focus in on what is the error that you think Dr. Schur made? Well, the biggest one, well, there's two of them. First of all, with the rotational aspect, he did not consider Newton's first and third laws, so that's a violation of classical physics. And then second of all, he assumed a free fall and we know that Mr. Sanderson did not free fall to the ground because he was standing up and he fell over and it's the velocity when you hit the ground, when you fall over is much less than a free fall. And we did those studies at the uh, uh, Naval Under Research Laboratory because we were interested in that research for our military personnel. So. Knowing what, because you can appreciate standing up, when you fall over, the speed of your feet is zero, whereas the speed of your head is something else. And it's much different than a free fall event. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. <laughs> Council? Uh, thank you. And uh, am I allowed to leave? Over? I have one question. Uh, if that's okay, Your Honor. James Egan has one more question. Oh, okay. Mr. Egan. Yeah. Oh, oh, thanks. Yep, thank you, Lawrence. I'm back, Dr. Bain. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's great. That's one last great. question. Do you, you were talking about free fall. Do you recall the testimony from Mr. Sanderson that he went airborne during the accident? I don't recall that. Okay, no. thank you. You're welcome. 
Anything uh, else? Uh, just one question. Uh, he, uh, is it possible for Dr. or for Terry Sanderson to have gone airborne when his skis were uh, on the snow? Uh, no, uh, no, that's not going to happen because uh, the the skier would have to go that hit him from behind would have to be going in excess of fifty or sixty miles an hour, which I think is highly unlikely unless we're dealing with an Olympic ski downhill skier here. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, Doctor Bain. No more questions. Thank you. Um, and uh, Your Honor, am I excused? Yes, you are. Thank you, Mr. Bain. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, guys. You guys have a great day out there in Utah. Thank you. That's all we have. No more witnesses, Your Honor. So you, you rest your rebuttal case? We, we rest our rebuttal case, yes. Okay. So you've now received all of the evidence. Your Honor, we, we looked into calling somebody, but we decided not to. Okay. So you've now received all of the evidence. I just need to ask the lawyers a couple questions and then we'll proceed. So could you approach the bench, please? Okay, members of the jury, you have been uh, handed the closing jury instructions. There's one more document you'll get before the, the parties argue, but we're gonna, we're gonna uh, give that to you right after the break. So we'll, I'm gonna read through these and then we'll take a short break. So these are jury instructions uh, 18 and 22 through 42. If you turn to page two, then you can make uh, notes on these if you'd like. So page two is jury instruction number 18, which has already been read to you, um, most of it, as modified, because I did modify it during the trial, and I read it to you during the trial as it stated right here. So now you've got the, the complete 18, the modified 18. Turning then to uh, jury instruction 22, which was also read to you during the trial on limited purpose evidence. Turning then to 23, a closing roadmap. Members of the jury, you have now received all of the evidence. Three things remain to be done. First, 
I will give you additional instructions that you will follow in deciding this case. Second, the lawyers will give their closing arguments. The plaintiff will go first, then the defendant, then the plaintiff may give a rebuttal. Finally, you will go to the jury room to decide the case. In the jury room, you will have two main duties as jurors. First, you will decide from the evidence what the facts are. You may draw all reasonable inferences from that evidence. Second, you will take the law I give you in the instructions, apply it to the facts, and reach a verdict. Instruction 24, closing arguments. When the lawyers give their closing arguments, keep in mind that they are advocating their views of the case. What they say during their closing arguments is not evidence. If the lawyers say anything about the evidence that conflicts with what you remember, you are to rely on your memory of the evidence. If they say anything about the law that conflicts with these instructions, you are to rely on these instructions. Counsel, could you remove that easel? It's kind of blocking my view of the jury. Number 25. You can just shove it over next to the screen. Legal rulings. During the trial, I have made certain legal or certain rulings. I made the, those rulings based on the law and not because I favor one side or the other. However, if I sustained an objection, if I did not accept evidence offered by one side or the other, or if I ordered that certain testimony be stricken, then you must not consider those things in reaching your verdict. 26, fault defined. Your goal as jurors is to decide whether Terry Sanderson was harmed, and if so, whether anyone is at fault for that harm. You must also decide whether Gwyneth Paltrow was harmed, and if so, whether anyone is at fault for that harm. If you decide that more than one person is at fault, you must then allocate fault among them. Fault means any wrongful act or failure to act. The wrongful act or failure to act alleged in this case is negligence. Your answers to the questions on the verdict form will determine whether anyone is at fault. We will review the verdict form in a few minutes after your break. Instruction 27, negligence defined. You must decide whether Gwyneth Paltrow or Terry Sanderson was negligent or whether they were both negligent. Negligence means that a person did not use reasonable care. We've all had a duty, we all have a duty to use reasonable care to avoid injuring others. Reasonable care is simply what a reasonably careful person would do in a similar situation. A person may be negligent in acting or in failing to act. The amount of care that is reasonable depends on the situation. Ordinary circumstances do not require extraordinary caution. But some situations require more care because a reasonably careful person would understand that more danger is involved. To establish negligence, Terry Sanderson has the burden of proving that one, Gwyneth Paltrow was negligent, and two, this, negligent, this negligence was a cause of Terry Sanders' harm. If you find that Gwyneth Paltrow was negligent, then you must determine whether that negligence was a cause of Terry Sanderson's harm and whether Terry Sanderson sustained damages. Gwyneth Paltrow claims that Terry Sanderson was negligent in causing his own harm, and that should read, and in causing her harm. To establish Terry Sanderson's negligence, Gwyneth Paltrow has the burden of proving Um, Gwyneth Paltrow has the burden of proving that one, Terry Sanderson was negligent, and two, that this negligence was a cause of Terry Sanders' harm and her own harm. I'll send in a corrected instruction 27. If you find that Terry Sanderson was negligent, then you must determine whether his negligence was a cause of his own harm and, uh, and her own, and Ms. Paltrow's harm, 
and whether Paltrow sustained damages. Instruction 28, allocation of fault. If you decide that more than one person is at fault, you must decide each person's percentage of, of fault that caused the harm you determine was suffered in this case. This allocation must total 100%. Mr. Sanderson's total recovery will be reduced by the percentage of fault that you attribute to him. If you decide that this percentage is 50% or greater, he will recover nothing. The same is true of Ms. Paltrow's recovery. When you answer the question on damages, do not reduce the award by Mr. Sanderson's or Ms. Paltrow's percentages. I will calculate that later. Instruction 29, violation of a safety law. A violation of a safety law is evidence of negligence. Terry Sanderson claims that Gwyneth Paltrow violated parts A and B of the following safety law. And Gwyneth Paltrow claims that Terry Sanderson violated part A of the following safety law. This is Summit County Ordinance Section 523, Reckless Skiing. A, reckless skiing prohibited. No person shall ski in a reckless or negligent manner so as to endanger the life, limb, or property of any person. B, skier's duty to injured party in the event of collision. Any skier involved in a collision resulting in injury to any person shall immediately stop at the scene of such collision and render to such person injured in such collision reasonable assistance, including the caring or the making of arrangements for the caring of such person by a physician, surgeon, or hospital for medical or surgical treatment if it is apparent that such treatment is necessary or if such caring is requested by the injured party. If you decide that Mr. Sanderson and or Ms. Paltrow violated the safety law, you may consider the violation as evidence of negligence. If you decide that Mr. Sanderson and or Ms. Paltrow did not violate the safety law, you must disregard the violation, disregard the safety law, and decide whether they acted with reasonable care under the circumstances. Jury Instruction 30, I've already determined that Gwyneth Paltrow did not leave the scene of the accident without giving her contact information. Jury Instruction 31, Spoliation. Ms. Paltrow has presented evidence that a GoPro video of the ski collision may have existed. Sanderson asserts that the GoPro video of the ski collision never existed. If you find that one, a GoPro video of the collision likely existed, and two, that any such GoPro video was in the possession or control of Sanderson, and three, that the plaintiff intentionally or negligently disposed of or lost the GoPro video of the collision, or otherwise failed to offer a reasonable excuse for failing to preserve the GoPro video of the coll collision, before a defendant had an opportunity to review and evaluate it. Then you may, but are not required to, conclude that the evidence would have been unfavorable to Sanderson. Instruction 32, introduction to tort damages, economic and non-economic damages introduced. I will now instruct you about damages. My instructions are given as a guide for calculating what damages should be if you find that either Terry Sanderson or Gwyneth Paltrow is entitled to them. However, if you decide no one is entitled to recover damages, then you must disregard these instructions. If you decide that Ms. Paltrow's fault caused Mr. Henderson's, Mr. Sanderson's harm, you must decide how much money will fairly and compensate him for that harm. If you decide that Mr. Sanderson's fault caused Ms. Paltrow's harm, then you may award Ms. Paltrow $1, which is the maximum amount she seeks. There are two kinds of damages, economic and non-economic. I would explain the difference between them. 33, proof of damages. To be entitled to damages, a party must prove two points. First, that damages occurred. 
there must be a reasonable probability, not just speculation, that a party suffered damages from the other party's fault. Second, the amount of damages. The level of evidence required to prove the amount of damages is not as high as what is required to prove the occurrence of damages. There must still be evidence, not just speculation, that gives a reasonable estimate of the amount of damages, but the law does not require a mathematical certainty. In other words, if a party has proved that they have been damaged and they have established a reasonable estimate of those damages, the other party may not escape liability because of some uncertainty in the amount of damages. 34, economic damages defined. Economic damages are the amount of money that will fairly and adequately compensate a party for measurable losses of money or property caused by another party's fault. Mr. Sanderson is not claiming any economic damages. Therefore, you should not award Mr. Sanderson any economic damages. Ms. Paltrow is seeking $1 in economic damages. 35, non-economic damages defined. Mr. Sanderson is seeking non-economic damages. Non-economic damages are the amount of money that will fairly and adequately compensate Mr. Sanderson for losses other than economic losses. Non-economic damages are not capable of being exactly measured, and there is no fixed rule, standard, or formula for them. Non-economic damage may still be awarded even though they may be difficult to compute. It is your duty to make this determination with calm and reasonable judgment. The law does not require the testimony of any witness to establish the amount of non-economic damages. In awarding non-economic damages, among the things that you may consider are one, the nature and extent of injuries, two, the pain and suffering, both mental and physical, three, the extent to which Mr. Sanderson has been prevented from pursuing his ordinary affairs, four, the degree and character of any disfigurement, five, the extent to which Mr. Sanderson has been limited in the enjoyment of life, and six, whether the consequences of these injuries are likely continue, to continue and for how long. While you may not award damages based on speculation, the law requires only that the evidence provide a reasonable basis for assessing the damages, but does not require a mathematical certainty. I will now instruct you on particular items of economic and non-economic damages presented in this case. Instruction 36, pre-existing conditions. Terry Sanderson is alleged to have had physical, emotional, or mental conditions before the time of the ski collision. He is not entitled to recover damages for those conditions. However, he is entitled to recover damages for any, for any aggravation of the conditions caused by Gwyneth Paltrow's fault, even if those conditions made him more vulnerable to physical or emotional harm than the average person. This is true even if another person may not have suffered any harm from the event at all. Gwyneth Paltrow has the burden to prove what portion of the alleged harm is the result of pre-existing conditions. If you are unable to make such an apportionment, then you must conclude that all damages, if any, you find were suffered by, Mr. Sanders, suffered by Mr. Sanderson were caused by Ms. Paltrow. 37, mitigation of damages. Each party had a duty to exercise reasonable diligence and ordinary care to minimize the damages caused by the other's fault. Any damages award should not include those that could have been avoided by taking reasonable steps. Terry Sanderson has the burden to prove that Gwyneth Paltrow could have minimized her damages but failed to do so. Gwyneth Paltrow has the burden to prove that Terry Sanderson could have minimized his damages but failed to do so. If a party made reasonable efforts to minimize damages, then your award to that party should include the amounts that he or she reasonably incurred to minimize them. Your Honor, my memory is that during 
instruction 38 was stricken by both parties yesterday. Okay. I actually, I, it wasn't. It was not. It was not stricken. I, I apologize. Please proceed. Okay. 38 collateral source payments. You shall award damages in an amount that fully compensates Terry Sanderson. Do not speculate on or consider any other possible sources of benefit Terry Sanderson may have received. After you have received your verdict, I will make whatever adjustments may be appropriate. 39, four-person selection and duties and jury deliberations. Among the first things you should do when you go to the jury room to deliberate is to appoint someone to serve as the jury four-person. The four-person should not dominate the jury's discussion, but rather should facilitate the discussion of the evidence and make sure that all members of the jury get the chance to speak. The four-person's opinions should be given the same weight as those of other members of the jury. Once the jury has reached a verdict, the four-person is responsible for filling out and signing the verdict form on behalf of the entire jur jury. In the jury room, discuss the evidence and speak your minds with each other. Open discussion should help you reach an agreement on a verdict. Listen carefully and respectfully to each other's views and keep an open mind about what others have to say. I recommend that you not commit yourself to a particular verdict before discussing all the evidence. Try to reach an agreement, but only if you can do so honestly and in good conscience. If there is a difference of opinion about the evidence or the verdict, do not hesitate to change your mind if you become convinced that your position is wrong. On the other hand, do not give up your honestly held views about the evidence simply to agree on a verdict, to give in to pressure from other jurors, or just to get the case over with. In the end, your vote must be your own. In reaching your verdict, you may not use methods of chance, such as drawing straws or flipping a coin. The verdict must reflect your individual, careful, and conscientious judgment. Instruction 40, do not resort to chance. When you deliberate, do not flip a coin, draw straws, choose opinions at random, or use other methods of chance. Instead, you must weigh the evidence carefully and come to a decision that is supported by the evidence. If you decide that a party is entitled to recover damages, you must then agree upon the amount of money to award that party. Each of you should state your own independent judgment on what the amount should be. You must thoughtfully consider the amount suggested, evaluate them according to these instructions and the evidence, and reach an agreement on the amount. You must not agree in advance to average the estimates. Instruction 41, Agreement on Special Verdict. After the break, I'm going to give you a form called the Special Verdict that contains several questions and instructions. You must answer the questions based on the instructions and the evidence that you have seen and heard during this trial. Because this is not a criminal case, your verdict does not have to be unanimous. At least six jurors must agree on the answer to each question but they do not have to be the same six jurors on each question. As soon as six or more of you agree on the answer to all of the required questions, the four persons should sign and date the verdict form and tell the bailiff that you have finished. The bailiff will escort you back to this courtroom. You should bring the completed special verdict form with you. And then jury instruction 42 I'll read to you at the end of the trial. So that, that completes these instructions. Um, I wonder if you could write your names on, on the top of that, because as you noticed, I did make some changes to a few of the instructions as we went along. And it, I'll have the bailiff insert the new and take out the old, if you could do that, the new instructions uh, before they're given back to you. Yes? Pardon me? Um, on the verdict form, the four person will write their number and their name uh, on the, on, when they sign it. And there's only be one signature on it, which would be the four person. 
and when I select the two jurors that will unfortunately have to leave us before deliberations, I'll just, I'll just tell you your juror number. I won't say your name, and I'll give you further instructions about those two individuals. So we'll, I'll do that in a few minutes after all the, uh, after all the arguments are completed. So we'll, at this time, we'll take a recess, and thank you. Defendants? You know, I would like to get a hard copy of the special verdict form just so I can read it one more time. We've got some issues with the verdict form. I wonder if you could come into chambers and we can kind of go through that. Thank you. And then the, could, could Peter Jensen have the defense binder index? And certainly one of the plaintiff's lawyers is welcome to be present to do the final swap out with the new index. He's sure. not adding one thing. He's deducting. And is that something we need to do before closings? No. No. He could do it at the moment. They're, they're discharged to deliberate. Normally, um, sure. well, if you want to get those, those into evidence, I suggest you try as soon as possible. And well, I do move to admit the new index, all those documents on the new index, which they have. Any objection? Are there any objections to the uh, index of defendants' Plain trial exhibits? No. Uh, all of the exhibits being received? Yeah. So okay. that's on the new index. And now he just needs to make the changes, including blacking out Mr. Sanderson's uh, contact information. Contact information. Social Security, birth date. Address is the one that's Address. most common. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So take a quick break and then have the bailiff bring you back to my chambers on the special verdict form. Thank you.
Ready for the jury? Okay, you should have on your chair uh, a document, three pages, called Special Verdict Form. I'm going to go through that right now. Members of the jury, please answer the following questions in the order that they are presented. If you find that the issue has been proved by a preponderance of the evidence, answer yes. If not, no. At least six jurors must agree on the answer to all of the required questions, but they need not be the same six on each question. When six or more of you have agreed on the answer to each question that is required to be answered, your four persons should sign and date the form and advise the bailiff that you have reached a verdict. Gwyneth Paltrow, question one. Was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault? Yes or no? If you answer yes, go to question two. If you answer no, go to question three below. Question number two, was Gwyneth Paltrow's fault a cause of Terry Sanderson's harm, yes or no. Regardless of your answer, go to question three. Terry Sanderson, question three. Was Terry Sanderson at fault? If you answer yes or no. If you answer yes, go to question four. If you answer no, go to question five below. Four, was Terry Sanderson's fault a cause of Gwyneth Paltrow's harm, yes or no? Regardless of your answer, go to number five below. Number five, if your answers to question one and three are both no, you should not proceed further except to date and sign this verdict form and return it to the courtroom. Otherwise, continue to question six. Comparative fault question six, Gwyneth Paltrow, what percentage of the fault do you assign to Gwyneth Paltrow? If your answer to either questions one or two is no, then enter zero percent and there's a blank and a place for you to put your number in. Proceed to question seven. Question seven, Terry Sanderson. What percentage of the fault do you assign to Terry Sanderson? And there's a blank and a place for you to put your percentage in. If, you ans if your answer to either questions three or four is no, then enter zero. The total must equal 100%. If Terry Sanderson's fault is less than 50%, Answer question eight. Do not deduct from the damages any percentage of fault that you have assessed to Terry Sanderson. The judge will make any necessary deductions later. If Terry Sanderson's fault is 50% or more, do not answer question eight and proceed to question nine. 
damages Terry Sanderson? Question eight, what amount fairly compensates Terry Sanderson for non-economic damages, dollar sign blank? Damages Gwyneth Paltrow, number nine, what amount fairly compensates Gwyneth Paltrow for economic damages? This cannot exceed one dollar, dollar sign blank. When six or more of you have agreed on the answer to each question that is required to be answered, your four persons should sign and date the form and advise the bailiff that you have reached a verdict. So we're ne we'll now hear from the lawyers uh, with their closing arguments. Plaintiff will go first. Check with the with the expert here. Hello, hello. Sounds good. Can you actually uh, do it again? Hello, hello. Yes. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for your attentiveness during these two weeks. Um, it's been a hard, long case. I've tried a lot of cases in my lifetime. This has been a hard, long case. By the way, it's about an hour each way going to Salt Lake with traffic, so uh, that adds to it. But you've been very attentive. I've seen I'm taking notes and paying attention. No one nodded off. So thank you again. <coughs> now, I'm going to turn on my... Lawrence and I are going to split this. By the way, I apologize for my cold. You can't really choose when those come. I've got asthma, and uh, it makes it worse. But I've done everything I can to uh, try to resolve it. Took all the tests. I'm negative for COVID, et cetera, but I, it still is plaguing me. So I apologize for the coughing. <coughs> Maybe a little bit more of that. OK. There are really three issues in the case. Number one, who hit whom? Number two, did it cause any damage? Number three, what are the damages? What are the damages? Uh, now, Gwyneth Paltrow, in this case, uh, is not a liar. Terry Sanderson is not a liar, OK? Uh, Gwyneth is a good person, OK? Uh, She's a good mother, and she loves her children, and she's passionate about many things. Now, we don't usually say good things about other people in our closing, but I think that's an accurate statement, okay? I think that she believes, and I believe Gwyneth Paltrow, when she says she believes. Uh, she says, Terry hit me in the back. Uh, and she believes it. It's a sincere belief. She's not a liar because of it. Pardon me, but the problem is a sincere belief doesn't make it so. Now, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Some of you are skiers and some of you aren't. Okay. Uh, uh, <coughs> pardon me. When you're involved in a ski crash, uh, it can be very confusing. I don't care who hit whom. You know, it can be very confusing. So I think she sincerely believes that she got hit in the back. <coughs> the problem is you have to make a decision based on the evidence that you've heard here, okay, on the evidence. Now, uh, let me tell you, uh, to illustrate this, about something that happened to me about a year and a half ago. Okay. Uh, we live in downtown Salt Lake, and we use that Costco or shop at that Costco on 17 South and 3rd West. Some of you have probably been there. It's the largest one in the world. Okay. We are having a hard time hearing them. Yeah, Mr. Sex, where's the microphone for that? Is it on your chest? Yeah. It, maybe it's not turned on. Oh. I'm, I'm picking it up, but it is just so faint from the ground. It says on. I know. I mean, I'm picking it up just fine on for the record, but no one else. Let me, let me maybe put it higher on your <coughs> Okay. Test. 
testing. I just got gas at Costco. It was about July of 2022, uh, no, 2021. And uh, I was uh, at intersection. This is a pretty busy intersection. There are two lanes north and south, two lanes east and west, two each. And there's a left-hand turn lane. I had a red light. Thing. And I was the first one at the intersection. I had a good look at it. I looked in my rear view mirror on my left side, and there are, there's a green arrow for each direction going east and west, turning south and turning north. Do you understand that? So uh, I'm waiting because I have a red light, and there's a lady across the way from me, car heading west but turning south. She had a green arrow, like I saw one uh, her heading north. I looked in my mirror, and here comes a guy at about 40, 45 miles an hour on the inside lane of 17 South. I said, my goodness, he's going to hit that woman. He's making that turn. And sure enough, <coughs> smack her and smack her hard. Okay? Didn't slow down at all. Well, I was, uh, had a good view of it. And the car spun around, but I was able to get by. There's a Maverick on the uh, uh, east, southeast corner of that intersection. Okay. I pulled in there, ran to her car, and asked her, are you OK? Like everybody does. She said, yeah, I think so. I didn't think she was, looking at her. But she said she was OK. OK? So I ran, ran over to the other guy. I was the first one there. Some people were beginning to stop. And the guy that ran the, the red light said, are you OK? He said, yeah, I think so. I said, well, why'd you run the red light? You know what his answer was? I didn't. It was green. Well, I wasn't going to sit there and argue with a guy like that under those circumstances. But he said it was green. So when the police came a few minutes, a couple minutes later, uh, and you got to be careful as an attorney. I gave them my card, not to get the case. You know, you can't do that. It'd be un unethical. But let people know who I was so they could call me. I gave the cop a, 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 a card, and I gave each of the persons a card. And about several months later, I guess I started getting calls from insurance adjusters, wanting me to tell them what happened. And I tell you that story because so often people that are in these types of events. Uh, have a totally different viewpoint. So we don't hold anything against Gwyneth for her viewpoint. It's sincerely expressed, but she's wrong based on the evidence. Okay? And Terry's correct. Now, what's the evidence that Gwyneth hit Terry? Okay. Number one, and there's no particular order on this, but Terry's a strong skier, advanced intermediate. Mr. Christensen said he saw him going down the hill doing wide radius turns. That's side to side, all the way, back and forth. Now, on a beginner's run, that's highly unlikely for an advanced skier. You don't do that. You don't do that. There's too many people. Uh, and so that doesn't make sense. <clears throat> Number two, I'll call it the scream heard around the world. Okay, this is being broadcast everywhere, by the way. It's on court TV. Uh, <clears throat> I'm getting emails every day from Canada, Great Britain. Uh, there's a loud scream. Terry heard it. A loud scream. Uh, Craig Ramon heard it and looked over. Several other people heard it. Carrie Oakes said she heard it. Eric Christensen heard it, so it called, caused him to look over. <laughs> before the impact. And uh, you don't, if you're the downhill skier, like Gwyneth claimed she was, you, you don't scream at something you can't see. You don't. It's the uh, uphill skier that's going to make that scream. And that was Gwyneth Paltrow. 
distraction. Uh, everybody here has probably been a parent, most of you, not some of you, maybe. Uh, but I've had my kids up there, and they want me to watch them ski. Uh, and mommy, mommy wants to ski. Now, Carrie Oaks said that, and that the deposition segment that you read said that three times. Okay? Three times. And uh, <clears throat> that's uh, important. Can we? Show Gwyneth's deposition up here. Your Honor, what are we talking about here? Mr. Sykes, is this deposition testimony that was read into court? Yes. Exactly. And is it only deposition testimony? No, yeah. Okay. Deposition, meaning trial testimony? Well, it was read into court. May, may we approach, Your Honor? Sure. You could make the screen only show the part that was I'm actually read in court. Is that, is that okay, Judge, like that? That looks good. Okay. Now, Mr. Paltrow, isn't it true? Isn't it true? I'm just a country lawyer here, okay? Isn't it true? Let's see if I can move it over a little bit. Okay. That your kids wanted to watch you ski. Or, pardon me, that the kids wanted you to watch them ski. Isn't that true? vague as the time. I can still watch my children ski and be skied directly into my back by someone. Okay? Which is what happened. Now I'm going to omit Mr. Owen's statement and my own, and here's how it reads. Isn't it true that your kids want to watch you ski? Or pardon me, that the kids want you to watch them ski. I can still watch my children ski and be skied directly into my back by someone, which is what happened. Now, there's an eyewitness, and uh, Craig Ramon. We were thought about having him testify again today about those drawings, but we decided not to do it. Uh, but he saw the whole thing. He saw the impact. Uh, and he's the only one that saw it. That's a key piece of evidence. Now, who is Craig Ramon? He's an acquaintance of Terry. Uh, he's part of a meetup group. He's not close to Terry. They went to get garlic burgers twice, okay? Uh, he has no dog in the fight, ladies and gentlemen. No dog in the fight. Uh, he's, an in, he's independently wealthy. You can tell that by what he does. Your Honor, that's as soon as fact's not in evidence. Well, it's, just a minute. Objection overruled. The jury will have to recall what the evidence was. And is it, the evidence was he sold his business, I don't know, 10 years ago, and all he does now is ski and travel and scuba dive. Okay? Uh, he has no reason, no motive to falsify this. Okay? Uh, confirmation, that was meetup. Uh, emails that you saw. Uh, 
there was a, one of the last evidence, I think it was 44, was it? I won't go over it with you. Uh, but we printed that out, I think, Saturday or Monday. It gives you the number of days since it was entered. And you add those up, you go right back to February 26, 27, 28, around there. Strong evidence. Uh, Terry has repeatedly said to his medical providers that he was hit in the back over a period of years. Uh, and that he has problems, medical problems from it. The broken ribs, that's, a, that's one of the strongest pieces of evidence you have that Terry was the guy that was hit. He was the downhill skier, okay? Four broken ribs, two of them separated like that, worked together. And that's uh, very serious, it's very painful. But the pattern of those broken ribs, two MDs, one from Utah and Dr. Bain, so that pattern of broken ribs <coughs> supports, supports the fact that he was hit from behind. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of that. That's what he said. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bain, who just uh, testified again today, said that Dr. Schur was simply wrong in his philosophy he, uh, or his formula. He assumed it was a, a free fall and it wasn't a free fall. Broken ribs. How do you get that? without a significant impact. Now, uh, the flaky Deer Valley investigation, I think suggests a cover-up. Uh, Eric Christensen, I think, was unbelievable and inconsistent. Uh, and there are a number of things. I'm not going to go over each one of them, but I will talk about one. The claim that Terry said he was okay. Now, some of you have probably had broken ribs or loved ones that have had them, you know. Even uh, Steve Graff up here said it's extremely painful. Now, uh, this whole process took place between 11.55, which is the time of Graff's incident report, and 12.02 when Ramon flagged down the ski patrol, and 12.04 when Whitney Smith arrived. So we're talking about, about uh, seven to nine minutes, okay? And they would have you believe that a man with four broken ribs, four, two separated, told not only Eric Christensen that he was okay, but two other unnamed, unidentified ski patrollers that never logged it in. He told them he was okay. Now that's just unbelievable that that would happen to a person with four broken ribs, not just one, but four. Uh, Ski between the legs. I don't know how many of you are skiers. I don't remember. You said it in your, in your interviews uh, three weeks ago. But uh, to have someone ski between your legs. She thought it was a sexual assault. Okay? But to have someone with both skis, to someone that's moving and shooshing back and forth, it's just another unbelievable claim. That can't happen. Now, um, and then went up skis away to lunch. Uh, the only way that Terry Sanderson knew that this was Gwyneth Paltrow is Christensen got angry and said, your buddy just took out Gwyneth Paltrow, which is an odd comment to make. Like, just took out a person, you know, but he had to put in Gwyneth Paltrow. That's the only way we know that. That's why you're here. Now, uh, <coughs> causation. Uh, did this event cause uh, an injury? Well, I've already mentioned this. The impact was significant enough to break four ribs. The impact in the fall. That is a significant impact. Uh, the location, the right front, <coughs> is where you would expect it under the circumstances. Uh, loss of consciousness. You know, uh, it was only a, a few minutes, maybe, maybe two, maybe three. But there was a loss of consciousness widely reported in 
the medical records and that day. Why did we report it? Uh, <coughs> I'd mentioned the okay. Uh, I don't want to mention that again. So uh, it was significant enough at the time, the very first thing that anybody noticed was that Terry forgot how to ski. He was snow plowing down the hill, an advanced intermediate snow plowing down the hill. Think about that for a minute, you know? Uh, <coughs> and Craig Ramon says, hey, Terry, you forgot how to ski. And that's when Craig Ramon said, I gotta flag someone down. So he did, and he told that person, he's got a head injury. That's the words he used, a head injury. Now, uh, it took him five seconds, and Craig acted it out up here, uh, five seconds to be able to tell him his name. He didn't know where he was at first. That's a significant impact. That's a concussion. Now, uh, ski patrol flagged down at 12.02. Whitney Smith arrives. What a sweet person. Uh, and Terry's taken off the hill on a toboggan. Now, you know, uh, <coughs> that's no fun. But it shows you something happened. Uh, she writes, disoriented, rib pain. Uh, loss of con by, by the way, uh, Alina Fong, who treats thousands and thousands and thousands of TBI victims, said loss of consciousness is not required. Okay? Not required. Uh, headache. And that, that day, uh, I think at the clinic in Park City, dullness in the front of the head. Uh, and <coughs> Whitney Smith said, go to the ER. And uh, Dr. Uh, McMahon said, go to the ER. So the next several months, you have numerous <laughs> symptoms of TBI that show up in the VA records. Cognitive, personality, social, and emotional. I could go through and show them to you, but you, you all saw them. <coughs> but then one of the most significant pieces of evidence here is a sudden and precipitous change in Terry Sanderson. Sudden and precipitous, okay? Now, I'm not talking about uh, when he came home and Carlene, you know, uh, uh, said he didn't want to be touched. He's got four broken ribs. But Carlene, who loved him, she said it was a love relationship. She wanted to marry him. They had been together uh, 300 days a year up here and then down there in St. George for about a year and a half. It's a long time to look at someone. She loved him. She traveled with him. She wanted to marry him. And you saw how she choked up when she uh, explained how the relationship ended, that he changed, his personality changed. Polly Gresham. Shay Harris, same thing, big changes. They didn't see him as often. So that sudden and precipitous change is a sign of brain injury. <laughs> Diagnosis of concussion, the VA diagnosed it. Uh, multiple uh, physicians diagnosed it. All the defense experts admitted it, every one of them admitted it. They minimized the extent of it, but they all admitted he had a concussion, every one of them, every one of them. Uh, Dr. Gibby, Dr. Fong, Dr. Goldstein, Dr. Bain. The only question was severity and permanency. But every one of them, they didn't want to admit it, but they gave different numbers between 5 and 20 percent of people that get a concussion. It's permanent. They have permanent problems. 5 and 20 percent for that. Dr. Fong thinks it's higher than that even. Uh, now, the physics. Dr. Bame explained the physics, uh, I think, second day of trial, and it, uh, a little bit today. But he's a neurologist, but he's also a biomedical engineer. Now, that's different than Dr. Schur. He's a biomechanical engineer. But Dr. Bame specializes in how force affects the body. Very highly respected in that field. And it's very rare, not very many of them. Um, Terry talked about the loss of friendships. Mark Haran, good example. They were good buddies when skiing and didn't like him anymore. 
we talked about <coughs> the uh, the woman that he was going to Europe with. Don't remember her name. You remember it, but she changed her mind at the last minute and had an empty seat. That's how Jenny got to go. Uh, the experience of the uh, his granddaughter uh, carrying into her for how to tie a knot. Big changes. Craig Ramon said, Terry, after the accident, uh, seemed like he could talk to the wall for an hour and have a good conversation. Um, faking. Uh, every witness you heard from, from the defense, admitted that Terry was not faking, malingering, exaggerating, or magnifying his symptoms. And uh, Dr. Goldstein said there are tests embedded in his tests to, to find that. No, no evidence of that at all. And by the way, the VA records continue up until the present day. And they didn't show you any single VA record where that was ever suggested of this man. Uh, NPH. They suggested, you know, that could just the uh, uh, normative, what is it called again? Normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, he's got it, but no symptoms. And it didn't change over about a 13 year period uh, 2009 to 2021. Dementia, they kind of implied that maybe he's got that, but when, when we cornered them on cross examination, not a one of them said he had dementia. And there's no reference, and he's thousands of pages of records, then he diagnoses. Um, degra degradation, <laughs> degradation of imaging, okay? We have imaging, I think, from 2009 to 2021, and all the defense experts, plus our own, said there's no degradation on these imaging. He hasn't, he's got white matter abnormalities, probably half of us do, Nothing showed in there. No problems. No increase. You heard that just as recently as yesterday. Uh, now, I'm going to say just a few more things here in terms of time over to my colleague, Lawrence Bueller. This is actually his case. He asked me to help. Um, that day when Terry left his home, to go skiing in a Deer Valley, that meetup group, February 26, 2016. He anticipated, like many, many other days in his life, a fun day of skiing. Okay? And uh, he, he never returned home that night as the same Terry. He never came home, figuratively speaking. Terry has tried to get off that mountain but he's really still there. Part of Terry will forever be on the bandana run, figuratively. Uh, people who are just after money, and that was suggested, he's just after money and fame, somehow going through all of this and spending all the money he spent on the experts, you know, he's doing it for fame. Give me a break. But he spent hours and hours trying to get better. If you heard anything about him, he, he is almost, what's a good word, uh, extreme in trying to get better. He does everything he can to get better. Um, anyway, uh, we hope that you will help bring Terry home off that mountain with a fair verdict today. Uh, now, before I turn it over to Lawrence, I want to say one more thing about executive function, okay? I had an experience up here that taught me about that. Forty years ago, I was in the legislature with a guy named Glenn Brown. I think he's still alive. He's in Colville, has a dairy farm, or did. And I used to kid him about milking cows, you know. So he invited me up to his farm. Young lawyer, going to show me how to how to milk cows. Never done it. Got up there, 
and he showed me around his barn. It was really sophisticated, four or 40 years ago. I mean, it's probably better now. But uh, when you think about why Terry never came home, think about this story and executive function. Because he put a little stool out there for me, and I, I sat down in my jeans and uh, tried to milk a cow by hand. It's very hard to do for a country boy like me. Uh, they grew up in the city. But I was able to uh, squeeze out a little bit of milk, you know. He gave me some to take home. Glenn Brown's a great guy. Uh, but I asked him about this situation. I said, how do you do all this? He showed me this very sophisticated uh, situation that milks cows automatically. Does it automatically. He says, without this, Bob, I could never make it. Couldn't do it. Can't get enough people to come help me do it by hand, like my grandpa did. Uh, that's executive function. That's what it does for us. We're able to do a lot of things in life. And that milking mechanism was executive function for Glenn Brown's farm to produce milk. Now, <coughs> this is one of Terry's saddest problems, his loss of executive function. Okay. He cannot organize and manipulate his life to do things like he used to do. It's the saddest thing. And that's why part of him is still up there on that mountain. Thank you. Lawrence? That's my signal to sit down. <laughs> I may have a few, a few more comments for you when he's done. Still, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Fielder, I don't know if we're picking you up yet. Okay. Can I try this? See if it works for me? Sure. This case is simple. You've heard the first two parts of this. Did this, who hit whom? And if, what are the damage that were caused to Terry? Or, um, and then the next question is, how much are those damages? And that's the part of the case I'll deal with. This case is, answer, is about answering the simple questions the law asks us to put on the form that we call the verdict form, which you'll get in a few minutes, or maybe a, in this afternoon. Verdict, that's an interesting word. It comes from Latin. It's actually two words. 
means verus, truth, or dicta, or uh, to tell, or told. So combined, it means truth told. And that's what you're here for, is the truth told. So what does the law want us to tell the truth about? Well, let's look at what the verdict form says. The first question is, was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault? As my colleague Bob Sykes said, the evidence is clear. There were four broken ribs, an eyewitness. There's lots of other evidence, too, circumstantial evidence, that Ms. Paltrow hit Terry Sanderson on February 26, 2016. The stories have been consistent for seven years. So the first question, we answer yes. Now, earlier, it, it was in uh, jury instruction number 27, the judge defined what negligence is, and judges around the country have a hard time defining what it is. It's very abstract, very abstract. And what it means, basically, is they knew it was dangerous to ski while distracted. They knew that someone could get hurt if they continue to do that. And they did it anyway. Did they know the damage would be this serious? Well, we've all heard about collisions. Collisions happen on the football field. Collisions happen even on sidewalks sometimes. People get concussions. And Terry, there's no doubt, suffered a concussion. But Terry's damage is not just a concussion that goes away in a few minutes or a few days or a couple weeks. We know that Terry's damage is or his concussion persisted for more than a year and a half. And that's been verified by Dr. Fong, Dr. Gibby, Dr. Goldstein, and Dr. Bain. Even the defense's experts admit that he had a concussion. They quibble on how long it's lasted. But none of those defense witnesses actually examined Terry. And as Bob pointed out, None of them really acknowledged that Terry had problems. <clears throat> One of them refused to acknowledge the before and after witnesses. His two daughters, actually three, but two daughters that testified in this trial, Shay and, Jen and Polly, his uh, friend Mark Harath, <coughs> uh, uh, finally, or the first witness after Craig Ramon was uh, Carlene Davidson, his ex-girlfriend. They'd known each other for 18 months before the crash, six months after the crash. <coughs> she testified that the uh, damage continued, thus making it a permanent, um, permanent, <laughs> this is a tongue twister, uh, persistent concussive symptom. And that permanent persistent concussive syndrome is the long-term brain damage that we're talking about. So what it means is every waking hour that Terry has, he's got this brain injury that causes the, so many problems for him from executive function to just you know, being able to deal with people. And as those witnesses showed, Terry has a problem. He, he looks fine. It's an invisible injury. People know, you know, that's what they say about brain injury. It's an invisible injury. You, 
you see someone with a brain injury and they look fine. What's wrong with them? If he has a brain injury, why, why isn't he in bed and moping around and not doing anything? Well, that's the opposite of Terry. It, well, it took a, well, the crash took much of what he had and left it on the mountain. Terry still has that drive to get better. And even though persistent concussive symptoms are permanent, they last a lifetime. They last forever. So 16 hours a day, Terry is dealing with this injury such that, as Bob mentioned, when people get to know him, they, after a while, they don't want to deal with him anymore. I'm sorry I have to say this, but uh, you know I've known Terry now six years. And this is just argument, but it's, it's real. Now, the four broken ribs, those were painful for maybe three months or so. And the, but the brain injury has persisted to this day and will last until he dies. <coughs> the uh, executive function, the social abilities, the, uh, uh, the mental problems, driving to the store, not having not knowing where you are and having to use GPS just to get home. These are real injuries that uh, Harry, who is uh, a very bright person, you would not know it just talking to him for 10 minutes. But once you get to know him better, you, you realize he's got these problems that just change everything. It's per so as I talked to someone, someone left me a message and it, every time I hear this voice message, it just makes me cry. Uh, just because it's so, f just kind of flat, but he says, you know, this person suffered a similar injury 30 years ago. A persistent concussive syndrome or injury, brain, a permanent brain injury. And she said, it's permanent. Your personality change is permanent. And you lose everybody who knows you. You lose everybody. Yeah, your family, they'll put up with you and maybe the lawyers, but really they're just putting up with you. So let's go to the next question. Well, I'm going to go through. Uh, because this is a complicated case, Ms. Paltrow is suing for one dollar. We're going to go through these next questions. Was Terry Sanderson at fault? Terry was hit from behind. Greg Ramone saw it. The rib injuries show it. Now, Dr. Scher, for the defense, who's not a medical doctor, He's a mechanical engineer, deals with ski bindings mostly. He says that Terry Sanderson likely skirted under Gwyneth Paltrow and somehow twisted around and broke his ribs. Uh, and the, as Dr. Bain confirmed again today, that's, all, that's impossible. It defies the law of physics. So I think you have to answer no. I mean, it's a clear no. Was Terry Sanderson at fault? Number three, no. So then you skip to go to five below. And since one is yes, this is like a puzzle. Well, it's like market. Market. <coughs> Here, I've got a pen. Here. I've got one. So was Terry Sanderson at fault? I'll, I'll go back to the first page. Was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault? Yes. Oh, I forgot to do number two. And you have to go in order. Was Miss Paltrow's fault the cause of Terry Sanderson's harm? It clearly is. Terry Sanderson was hit from behind. There was a scream, and, it, and he was hit from behind. So the answer is yes. So then we go to three. And because we answer number three, no, we skip to five. If your answers to one and three are both no, you should not proceed. Well, we, we got a yes, two yeses. Otherwise, continue to question six. 
Gwyneth Paltrow, what percent of fault do you assign to Gwyneth Paltrow if your answer to either one or two is no? Then enter zero. And to be honest with you, this is the first time I've seen the form because it was just finalized just before we started the open. So I have to think about this one a little bit, but let's think about it together. Um, number, uh, what percent of fault do you assign to Gwyneth Paltrow if your answer to either one or two is no, then enter zero? Well, both are yes. So we have to, because Terry Sanderson did not cause this crash. You can't cause a crash when you're hit from behind. What percent of fault do you assign to Terry Sanderson? Well, it has to add up to 100, so you have to put in zero there. If Terry Sanderson's fault is less than 50 percent, answer question eight. Well, it is, so we skipped eight. What amount fairly compensates Terry Sanderson for non-economic damages? Non-economic damages. Our time on Earth is the most valuable time we have that we know of, at least in this existence. Our time on Earth is one of the most valuable things there are. There are paintings on a wall that are worth 50, 100 million dollars. There are houses on these mountainsides that are worth 5, 10, 20, much more millions of dollars. There's even racehorses that are worth tens of millions of dollars. Well, Terry's none of those. Terry's in the last days of his life. The, he probably has at least 10 years left, according to what a lot of people think. He's a, he guards his health. He doesn't smoke. He's, he's trying to pursue a healthy lifestyle every single day. Yeah, he goes to the doctor. But he, so he's, since the crash, it's been seven years. And let's say another 10 years, every single day, he's got a 16 hours of dealing with this brain injury, this persistent concussive sim symptom that causes all these problems. So how do we calculate that? As the instruction says, for non-economic damages, jury instruction 35, which you all have, it gives a detailed instruction about that. Pain, suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, and a retired person, well-to-do person like Terry, who worked all his life, th these are these golden years. These are the most valuable years when you can enjoy your retirement and actually do things like travel. But now he has to travel with other people or he gets lost. Dr. Fong. And his other therapists, all, most of his therapists have said, what's the best way to deal with you know, your brain injury? Well, do the things that make you happy. Be active. He could sit around and mope around and be an obvious brain injury victim, but no, Terry doesn't want to be brain injured. He wants to live life to its fullest. So 16 hours a day, he's got this issue that where a big part of him was left up on that bandana ski run. So you have the power here. This is, before we were just arguing and presenting evidence and the judge was ruling on it, but now the judge is going to pass the case to you. And uh, this is where you decide what happens next. So I'm going to suggest, I'm not going to ask, this is not a, Terry asked me several years ago when I first learned of this, his case, well, what do you think it's worth? I said, well, Terry, could you, if you could turn the earth backwards like Superman, go back in time, and how much would Terry 
take to not have what he has now? And he says, I'd rather go back in time and never have this. So how, how do we calculate this? Well, I'm going to suggest a number. Uh, a count, this is just a suggestion that we do it with 16 hours a day. About the formulas, Dr. Bame and Dr. Schur give you a lot of formulas, but uh, hopefully these will be simple, more simpler than all those. So that's 16 hours a day. Then the next question is the years. Well, it's been seven years since the crash. <coughs> Terry's likely to live another 10 years. Probably, we hope, longer, much longer. He wants to live at 130. <laughs> but, you know, at least 10 years. So seven years since the crash, 10 years, that's 17 years. So we're going to times the next number, 17. Then the question is, how much does Terry, how much is, not the price, there's no price that you can give for Terry's time, but what is the value that's been taken away from Terry? What is the value? I mean, there are lawyers and they're experts and lots of people here that are making you know, low wages, but a lot of people are making four, 300, 400, 500 an hour. Well, I'm just suggesting a number. You can put in whatever number you want. This is for the non-economic damages that Terry deals with every day. So that's the next number. 16 times 365 times 17. I'm going to suggest a number. You put in the number you think is fair for Terry, the full value of the harms and losses that he's dealing with every day. I'm going to say $33. $33. And I've done the math because I told you in the opening, you know, except for the small change at the end, you know, a couple hundred dollars. This equation is $3,276,000 for the 17 years that Terry has to deal with this permanent brain injury. Yeah, you could, you could say, well, you know, it's priceless, but, you know, an old shoe is, that's priceless. No, this is the most valuable time of his life. And it, so that's the amount that I suggest you consider. So what is this case not about? It's not about celebrity. It's not about that. Yeah, there are lots of indications of that, but this is about a man's life. What does the defense want to make this case about? They want to make it about... Terry's multiple issues, the 69-year-old Terry that was on that hill, oh, yeah, he had all sorts of medical problems, but the defense wants to make it about that. Uh, but that didn't mean, I mean, he was skiing on that hill at Deer Valley. I, mean, I can't think of any place that I'd rather be skiing than Deer Valley. Uh, maybe, you know, backcountry powder, where, but the point is he was healthy enough to ski and now he doesn't ski. Now I'm going to tell you a quick story about the legend of King Morgan. King Morgan was the real king back in England about a thousand years ago. Back then, the kings were the law. They'd, someone had a dispute. A farmer knocked an eye out of a, his neighbor. It was eye for an eye justice. They'd take the eye out of the guy who did it and the vic what did the victim get? Nothing. Well, King Morgan one day said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to invite 10 of my, or 12 of my nobles, you know, the, the guys that have the littler castles, and I'm going to have them come in, and I'm going to have them listen to a case. And, they, and he heard their case, the nobles heard the case, and then they, they, made, they said, well, we think 
it should be decided this way. And the king said, yeah, you're right, and that's good. So he, they did it a few more times. And finally the king said, you guys decide the cases. I'm going to go off and do what kings do and hunt and fish and fight battles. Well, that's the, the same system that was adopted in the Magna Carta almost a 1,000 years or 800 years ago. And it's the same system that was brought over by the pilgrims that we celebrate Thanksgiving for. And it's the same system in our country. And we're the only country that still has the jury system where people like you decide the cases. And Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England during World War II, he said, America is a great country. And one of the reasons it's so great is its jury system. And it's, no other country has it. And if you want to weaken America, take away its jury system. Thank you. We'll take a short recess before we continue. Um, maybe about 15 minutes. break.
Thank you. Are we ready for the jury? We are? Okay. We're ready for the jury. All right, thank you. Mr. Owens, are you ready to proceed? Thank you, yes. Just to be clear, because James is going to share the time with me. Sure. And uh, is the plaintiff reserve any time for rebuttal? They reserve 10 minutes, which I granted them. And so do they have an hour and 10 minutes? And do we have an hour and 10 minutes? They reserved, they reserved 10 minutes, so you, can, you can proceed. Hour, so we have one hour. You can take one hour, and, and if it happens to go over because you're fin <coughs> finishing a topic or something, that's fine. Thank you so much. Well, folks, we didn't even know each other two weeks ago, and here we are. Thank you. Uh, it's a beautiful thing, I think, that we resolve disputes in our country in this way, just like Lawrence mentioned. Um, you're plucked, and really against your will, even. If you had to fight it, in theory, one of these bailiffs could go arrest you and, come and make you come here. So we don't do that with anything else, but why do we do it? because it's such an important thing to resolve disputes in our country in a peaceful manner. So, thank you. I'm Miss Paul Throes, and I'm gonna just call her Gwyneth. I'm Miss Gw I'm Gwyneth's lawyer. I'm her spokesman this week. So she sat there for two weeks and been a punching bag. We've blown through a lot of s these cute little, uh, post-it notes where she's sending me stuff. But I take it very seriously because she's comfortable in a lot of worlds I'm not comfortable in. But she is not comfortable in this world. It is not a nice thing for someone to throw a press conference and say, like King Kong, you knocked, her, knocked him out and walked away, <coughs> skied away. That is not what happened. And the court has actually dismissed the, the idea, and that's one of your jury instructions, that this was a hit and run. That took no small amount of work, by the way. But that is what she was faced with. It takes a lot of courage, does it not, for her to sit there for two weeks and be pounded like a punching bag. What did she lose? Did she lose, oh, that's too bad. You had to come in early and have a massage. No. This is what she lost. She was in love with Brad Falchuk. Dated for two years. They both had, very interesting, I think, nine-year-old sons and 11-year-old daughters. Kind of cool. And they said, how are we going to get these guys together in a loving, uh, fun, Time. They're very busy, where we can kind of all be together for a couple days and see if this will work, if we can blend our families together. We're going to be, make it relax. We're going to put a lot of planning. She put a lot of planning into that trip. And so here they are. It's a little delicate, because our, our, anyone who's been through like trying to blend families, it's a delicate thing. So what happened? They got there. They're organized, first day of skiing. They have ski instructors. By the way, I thought it was cool. I don't know if you did. Her dad taught her to ski at Alta. And she has tender feelings about that. She's been cheerful with me in describing those ski trips with her dad, because her dad died in his 50s. In fact, it was so painful, she didn't ski for a long time after that, because she would miss her dad. But when her kids were of this age, 
and we're talking with Brad. Brad was a big skier. We didn't get to hear from him, unfortunately, lack of time. But they were going to come. OK, let's get our kids together. So what did they lose? They lost a half day of bonding, and even more, because now everyone's stressed. That was the day when they bond up going up the ski lift. They bond having hot chocolate mid-afternoon. They bond relaxed, laughing around the fire at night. They lost that because he hit her. He hit her. He hurt her. And then he asked her for $3 million for the pleasure. That is not fair. And I'm grateful that we have a court system that permits anyone to sue anyone for about a $250 fee, and that they can have their day in court. And I think Mr. Sanderson, by all accounts, will have some peace after this trial, regardless. But it's come at a steep cost, a deep cost to my client. I told you when we first met, I wanted to concentrate on a couple things about Lady Justice here. By the way, if I didn't make it clear, you are Lady Justice. All right. Blindfold eyes. Because she's blind? No. She's smart. But she's not going to be distracted by chaos around her. Chaos like media. Chaos like uh, sympathy. Oh, I, don't we all feel bad for him? I would have liked, by the way, at least a discount on the camel ride on, on your request for damages, but that's another issue. The idea is, OK, we're going to focus. We're going to focus. And we've tried, and the judge has given you all these warnings. Don't be talking to people. Don't even talk to yourselves yet, because we want you focused. And that's, that's lady justice. Now, I talked to you earlier about the scales of justice. This is a civil claim, meaning the preponderance of the evidence. The plaintiffs brought the lawsuit. That's why we're all here. His daughters say, isn't it terrible? These two daughters that he's brought here, his life is laid open. It's because of him. He hit her. He hurt her. And he wants $3 million for it. That's not fair. The easy thing for my client would have been to write a check and be done with it. But what does that tell her kids? It, you just, well, it's cost of business. No, it's wrong. It's actually wrong that he hurt her and he wants money from her. And that's why we're here. All right, so the, back to the scales here on Lady Justice. He has the burden to tilt, OK? Ty goes to her. Now, she has a $1 counterclaim. My wife said, don't waive the dollar, and I'm not waiving the dollar. But a dead even tie means neither get anything. And I'll walk you through that in just a minute. But let me suggest it's not even close. Let me suggest it's like this, the evidence here versus here. And let me talk to you about that. Let me mention a couple other jury instructions. So I talked to you about no sympathy, passion, or prejudice. We don't want you making decisions on that basis. I talked to you about uh, the burden of proof. That is theirs. And then from today, let me talk to you about a few things. By the way, the burden of proof was evident because they get the last word. Because they have to tilt the things, you may have noticed this morning they could call a witness. And after I'm done, they can speak for a few more minutes. And that's, that's what we do to the people who have a burden of proof. Instruction 30 that you were read today, Gwyneth Paltrow did not leave the scene of the accident without giving her contact information. Press conference four years ago. King Kong came out of the jungle, left me unconscious, and, and 
and brushed off and went away. Utterly BS, and it's been discounted. It's not even before you. The judge took that away from you because it was so obviously false. 31 deals with spoliation. That's the GoPro issue. Spoliation is probably a word you never heard before. It's a legal term. But the idea is if they destroy evidence, you can assume that it was bad for them. All right, so Terry, in fact, I should say Mr. Sanderson, in fact, owned a GoPro. All right. He talked to his daughter that night, 6 p.m., so about six hours after the collision. <coughs> she got off the phone with the understanding that he had a GoPro video of the incident and typed to him, I am so glad that there's a GoPro and that you're OK. All right, no one has the GoPro. But I'm telling you this, if you find that there was a GoPro and that he said, hmm, that will not help my case, delete. If that happened, you can conclude that it was a, uh, against him, that it helped us. And wouldn't it have been nice if it had been around? Do you remember when we talked eight, nine days ago? I said, you're going to hear so much stuff about damages. So much stuff. But if you find that he hit her, you can ignore it. So we heard like a week of testimony about Mr. Sanderson's brain and how he thinks. He does like to be the center of attention. He likes to be in the spotlight. His own daughter said he would be dishonest for money or notoriety. Does that make you, like, uncomfortable? It makes me really uncomfortable. When Dr. Gibby was up there, he said, oh, he has a great relationship with his daughters. It's like, who? He says, two, two daughters. There are three daughters. You can't just pretend this stuff away. Three daughters. It's pretty important, isn't it, for a witness to know that he's, he's not in the least good relationship. And why? Because she said he was, he was abusive. Um, and a lot of other uh, adjectives that I'm not actually, actually will defer to you to remember. So Ms. Paltrow is asking for her dollar, daughter, dollar, but it's not about the dollar. It's not about, uh, I mean, think of what her time is worth sitting here for two weeks. It's not about the money. It's about kind of ruining a very delicate time in a relationship where they're trying to get their kids together. That's what Terry Sanderson caused her. Pre-existing conditions, oh my gosh. How do we not talk about what was going on right before and what versus what's happened after? He's 76. I mean, my parents, I hate, I'm not being flippant. They were dead by then. They certainly weren't taking 10 trips around the world. So we have to look at that. Those are the, those are the jury instructions. I do want to tell you the special verdict form that was appropriate. Can you bring that up? Lawrence walked you through it. And I don't think there's any harm in me telling you what I want. Is there? <laughs> I'm going to ask you to, to, to fill this out. This is what you go to the delivery when you deliberate. These three pages. The last page really is nothing. So it's essentially nine questions. And I want, I want to show you how I want you to fill it out. I'm not trying to be subtle. <laughs> All right, so was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault? No. If you answer no, go to question three. So next page. Then you have to, that, that means Ter, Terry Sanderson's not going to take any money away from today. If you write no, so no on one, you are done kind of in all afternoon. Was Terry Sanderson's fault a cause? Yes. And then, James, if you answer 
regardless of your answer, go to five. If your answer is to question, so this is like a tax form where you have to like read it four times, sorry. If your answers to questions one and three are both no, one was as Gwyneth at fault, you should not proceed any further. And you go to the end and sign it. And this is because you're, feel, you're trying to figure out, uh, was she at fault? Yes or no. Was he at fault? Yes or no. Did it cause any damage? You can actually find today that neither were at fault. Skiing is an interesting thing. We strap sticks on our legs at the top of a very high hill and go down for fun. It's breathtaking. I've done it. I love it. But it has inherent risks. So the back of every ski pass you've ever seen. Judge, objection. You've, you've excluded this inherent risk of skiing. We referenced this, it, Your it, Honor. It, you it, said it I could applies, argue. It, it applies to resorts and not to people. No, no, the argument is a proper, so overruled. So inherent risks, you've seen it on the back of every ski pass. And even your own common sense says, hey, if I don't go down this hill right, I could actually kill myself. So, skiing is different. It's even different than driving. I mean, we don't drive cars down hills, right? Down icy hills. But we do ski down icy hills. The Deer Valley guy would say, we're never icy at Deer Valley. But nevertheless, it's kind of a dangerous thing. And uh, so you can actually say no. Don't get me wrong. I want Gwyneth paid for the, for this the hardship Mr. Sanderson caused her. He hit her, he hurt her, and he's not entitled to sue her. I'm sorry, he's entitled to be here today, but he's not entitled to be rewarded for hurting her. That's not how this country works. All right, James, let's see. Then if we go, other. If your answers to one and three are both no, you should not proceed further. So if you found not at fault, not at fault, you're done. You go to the end, and your four person signs it. But if you keep going, otherwise continue to six, James. What I, I couldn't do this without James, if you can't tell. What percent of the fault to you assigned to Gwyneth Paltrow? So then you have to figure out a percentage. It's possible that both people are at fault. And how this works is you take 100% pie and you find out, OK, Gwen is 10% at fault, Terry's 90% at fault. So you, a lot of things aren't just so obvious, like gray and white, black and white. We would, obviously, if you get this far, we'd want you to put zero apportionment to her, Terry, 100%. I guess you could find that Gwen is entitled to 75 cents and not $1, believe it or not. <laughs> OK, then we keep going. James, whatever you can find here. What amount compensates Terry Sanders? And we just want you to go to nine and give us our dollar. There was a little issue raised about whether her attorney's fees could be added to that. The judge has said, I'm going to deal with that. That's not in front of you. All right, so your, your, your topic is this dollar. Believability of witnesses. This was one of your earlier instructions. How do I figure out who's telling the truth here? And I'm going to put Craig Ramon. First of all, Terry doesn't know, doesn't remember much. There was one just blatant misstatement in their closing, which was Terry could talk to a wall for two hours and have a pretty good conversation. That was before the incident. So that was misrepresented as being after the incident. Every time that issue came up, I said, before? Yes, before. All right. Uh, let's go to talking about evaluating witnesses. I'm telling you, if we were in law school and we had a class about eyewitness, how an eye claimed eyewitness is actually sees what he thinks he sees, Craig Ramon would be the definition of a bad witness. 
And I'm going to give you some objective statements about that. He's at the end of the court. He says, I'm skiing. And there at the end, I'm colorblind. I have imperfect vision. I don't know what they're wearing. I'm looking at other things. I'm not focused on them. He said he hears and turns. Well, guess what? Eric Christensen, the ski instructor, who they accuse of a cover-up, which was dismissed, heard and turned. He, he's the, he, they're the same. They heard and turned. Craig describes himself as an eyewitness. Eric said, I didn't see the collision. I just heard and turned. They saw the same things. Interestingly, Eric came right over, and now's the appropriate time to watch our little fun video. I don't know if you like these animations, but we kind of put them together so that you guys can kind of envision all this information coming at you. So Dr. Eric Sanderson, or excuse me, Eric Christensen, did you like the guy? The, the guy is like, oh my gosh, I love this guy. He's been doing it for 40 years. He teaches art on the side. He's been a lifelong resident. He's married to someone whose whole life is skiing. And he is not a liar. He is not someone who covers up. He is not someone who falsifies reports. All of those allegations were thrown out. So we're not de dealing with Deer Valley. Interestingly, it's not just Ramon versus Christensen, because all the Deer Valley people, did you, do you remember the cool Whitney who took the toboggan woman? I mean, she's an amazing witness. She's up there, oh, I'm assessing things all left and right, you know, nothing, 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 but that's a little different. So we're going to play this, and I think Moses is in orange, and there's Terry. So Eric Christensen says he sees Terry out of the corner of his eye. Well, he looks and sees, because he's trying to, he's in charge of sort of protecting these kids. So he says he's always looking up the mountain. And then uh, he hears and turns. And then the next view, the next one. By the way, no one has, no one but Craig has the guy, the, the guy spread out, spread eagle with his head down the hill. There's no facial damage to his face. His skis stayed on. You've heard from these uh, structural uh, bioengineering people. If he came and got hit like Craig described, his skis would have popped right off. You don't, you don't keep your skis when you get blown. Sanderson says he was airborne, that he was flying. First of all, I'm not going to get into the weight, have him set, sit on scales, but Ms. twice, by the way, not once, twice Sanderson, Mr. Sanderson said, I'm, I'm, this, I'm three inches shorter and 20, 15 pounds lighter. We're not talking about today. We're talking about then. Then he, he was three inches. I don't know if he shrunk three inches since then, but he described himself as pudgy. He's coming downhill at a faster pace. I mean, uh, anyway, the structural engineering people, which is kind of interesting, not structural, biomedical engineering people. I don't know if you got bored in that part or was interested, but I'm telling you, the science does not work. For, for Craig's theory. OK, so we're going to play this. Mr. Christensen, am I in your way, Judge? No. There's Moses, Carrie Oaks, Apple. It's a little hard to absorb, but here's Gwyneth. And there's Sanderson. Now, let me tell you what Sanderson said. And he said it just at the end of the day yesterday. I said, tell me what's going on right before the incident. He said, there was a lady on his left that was kind of tentative. So I deliberately, I think I said, passing on, your, on the right. Pretty sure I did. 
So there's the woman he describes in green. And he's trying to sort of, he's watching her. He is blind in his right eye. He said, I use that term loosely. He's an optometrist, for heaven's sakes. He's blind in that eye from a stroke. He has caught, helped him contribute to his retirement. OK, so he's watching. And imagine, imagine this. I'm blind in my right eye. And I'm really mindful of not hitting this woman to the left of me. And then he said, Nobody could have passed on my left except the gal I just passed. So that gal I was real conscious of because I still worried about her. And so as I went past her, I went inches, inches per second past her. I just remember it took forever for me to get past her and there were skis. And then that's when the collision happened. All right, so maybe run it one last time, James. So he's looking to his left with a blind right eye to make sure he doesn't hit the woman. He's looking to his left. And what happens? Gwyneth described and praise to the judge for not letting this be reenacted with Gwyneth and being assaulted in front of us all. Uh, she is skiing. And two skis come in between her. And she's, they, this is not a big hill. By the way, I mean, this is, these are kind of photographs. This isn't just claymation here. And comes in, and she's like, what is happening? They're not going that fast. But Terry's going faster because he's, his skis are coming in between her. It's because he's le looking with his one by the way, he has like half an eye, because he has a cataract in the left eye, hearing shot. And he says, I, I'm getting too old. Uh, I can't do everything I can. Well, I'm, I mean, I stopped playing church basketball after my knee injury. I'm like, I love it, but I'm, I, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> OK, so sometimes we have to give things up, especially when we're 76 years old. I'm sorry. I mean, that's life. But she comes in between, he comes in between her legs. She's going, what is going on here? It's not a, like a ski collision hit, you're out. And uh, he's grunting, his body's against her. She's thinking, am I being assaulted? Like, because this isn't really a ski collision. And then they go for a little while, she said spooning. And then, and whatever the next imaging uh, next animation would be James. And then they go to their, le to their right. Now, I don't know. You've heard uh, the ribs issue. By the way, if you're 76 with osteoporosis, you can, hit, you can break your ribs. You may see in this records in your documents, these weren't dramatic breaks. I mean, two weren't, were not even distended, dislocated. What's the right word? This placed. Thank you. Two were not displaced, and two were just very minor displaced. Did they hurt? I'm sure they hurt them. I'm sure they did. All right, so she is on top. Eric Christensen said she was on top. And uh, their skis are intertwined. And what is she doing? She's like, what's, OK, I see, I see what's, I'm not being assaulted. And he may well have hit his head. He does have a helmet on. So does she, by the way. Craig Ramon's like, no, no helmet. He tried to change his testimony on the stand, but I had questioned him like five years earlier. No. He, she didn't have, I was really surprised. She, no helmet, no mask. Give me a break. For anonymity purposes as well as safety, uh, this is a person skiing with her kids. She's pretty focused on safety. Let me just tell you that. All right. So she, what's the first thing does? Eric Christensen, is this the last one? Is this the last of the there animations? There were only three admitted, Judge. There Pardon were, me? I, there were only three were admitted. I think there were five. Three full ones. Three. Whatever you can take us to next. 
Well, but you've already shown three. There were th there were three videos that were Eric. That were entered in their total, and then there were two only partial. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. So whatever you can give two me. Two partials next. that didn't show the actual impact. Only Craig has their heads downhill. Moses, who you'd you'd love him if he's he's a cute little sixteen year old now. Uh, he's but we didn't get it. We only got to hear him. He skis over because his he doesn't hear anything, but his. His instructor comes over, he comes over, and he sees his mom on the ground, now downhill, because she's gotten away from this guy. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm safe. The idea of an assault just entered her mind, she said, for a short sec couple seconds, because she's going, what's going on? This is the overhead view, and run it as you can. Here's Ms. Paltrow. Paltrow. Apple, Moses. Here's Ms. Paltrow. Here's the beginning skier woman. Here's Sanderson. And he's going to, she's making these small turns on the right. He's making big turns. He's a lot faster. He's a lot more advanced skier, I should say. All right. Here's Christensen. You remember we placed him? Carrie Oaks went on ahead with Apple. Apple told me she heard a commotion, but she was hangry for French fries, and she just wanted to get down the hill. Uh, Moses is here. And so uh, there we go. OK, any other animations? Looking uphill. Paltro in black, Sanderson, beginning skier in green, woman, watch Sanderson, and then we're done. So it's probably that third one, that two back, that's probably the most powerful of them in terms of showing you the layout. All right, how many? How am I doing on time, folks? I want to leave James 10 or 15 minutes. 30 minutes so far. Thanks. So I'm going to 10 after. Thanks, Judge. After they've separated, Brad Falchuk uh, comes up. She skis down. But there's then this period of time. So here's Eric Christensen. Eric Christensen said, I came over to find out what had happened. They say he came over to bully him. Deer Valley employees who bully their guests get fired. He's been there 40 years. You could see if his grandfatherly demeanor makes sense uh, under Craig Ramon's story. It doesn't. It doesn't. Eric comes over, and he says, the first thing I'm doing, I'm taking off skis. Remember, under all stories, no skis came off. That tells you something about the, the, the manner of the collision, doesn't it? It wasn't a, like Ramon describes, flat out straight. By the way, Ramon, oh my gosh, he says he's out cold for two or more minutes. Do you know what, what and what did you do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Could you imagine looking at an unconscious person, splayed out, head down, skis on, for over two minutes? Could you imagine? I'm like, did you call 911? Did you check for breathing? No. Yeah. None of that. I mean, good grief. Give me a break. All right. Eric Christensen comes over and says, OK, let's take skis off. Remember, he had some personal knowledge, because he, he knew kind of where Gwyneth was. And he kind of knew where Eric Christensen was. He knew where they were, downhill versus uphill. And he knew their skill level. He could tell, he said he could tell because uh, that um, Mr. Sanderson was an advanced skier because he didn't slide. I, I didn't really know this. But <coughs> if you do kind of, you skiers will maybe know. If you can work your edges and you don't slide, apparently that means you're a more advanced skier. OK, so 
um, he comes over, he's trying to figure out what's going on, but he actually knows some <coughs> things. Gwyneth is pissed off. If you hit someone, do you yell at the person you just hit? No. The hittee, and I've been hit skiing, is, is usually the unhappy one. But she recognizes these things happen until he says, did you hit me? And she's, now she's mad because not only has he hurt her and hit her, but now he's saying, no, I, I don't think, I think you caused this. And then she's like, are you kidding me? You just ran in my effing back. And Moses heard it. Moses heard it. All right. So then Christensen, who I think is just a fabulous witness, I think everything he said is just utterly true. It, it's consistent with everything. He took off skis. I said, was, San, was Sanderson ever out cold? No. If, if he was, it was like, it would have been like, like that. Gwyneth, how, was he out cold for two minutes? No, he wasn't out cold at all. Don't you think people would be going like crazy if there was a man splayed out on Deer Valley, head down, out cold for minutes? That's a, not a believable story. Eric Christensen now is engaging people. Gwyneth's mad, but she's OK in the sense that she doesn't need help. She can still ski. But she said her, her knee, which she'd already had surgery on, hurt. And she has sustained a blow. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been hit. Even if you're in a football game and you're all padded up, he, he, she had sustained a blow. She was upset. And then this idea of uh, him not sort of, she, she says, you know, you just did this. And then what did he say? I'm sorry. Does the person who got hit say they're sorry? No. The hitor says, I'm sorry. And he said it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. OK, now she's OK. OK, he's not going to, he's not denying the stupid thing he just did. But OK, now we got to sit around and kind of sort things out. Then Eric Christensen goes to Sanderson. Uh, tell me what you want to say. And he said, she appeared right in front of me. That's what he said in his report. She appeared right in front of me. That's consistent with Gwyneth being mad and saying, you just skied into my effing back. And it's consistent with, Chris, with Christensen seeing kind of what was going on. He was the uphill skier. He, he knew that. And there you go. That's, uh, if everything's consistent, now if he'd said, I didn't do it, she hit me. OK, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now we got to investigate. And then, do you recall? So, so OK, it's clear who did, who did what. Christensen says to Ramon, your buddy just took out Gwyneth Paltrow. I think this was just after she skied away. And what did Ramon say? Did you correct him? No. That's the time to say, no, I saw it. <coughs> and she hit him. That was the time. Ramon didn't say a word. He just sat there. He's not helping his unconscious friend, and he's not denying under his story what the ski uh, Deer Valley representative has just determined. Your buddy took out her. All right. So that's the time to do it, not later. Do you remember one of the things I said in opening is rely on the evidence before there's thoughts of lawsuits. Because then you can kind of rely. People aren't thinking, OK, 10 minutes later, oh my gosh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Wow, that's something else. We were just in a collision with Gwyneth Paltrow. 
Now people are thinking, okay, wow, I'm famous. They're not thinking that yet. In real time, he's saying, I'm sorry, and then, are you okay? Everyone always asks this question, are you okay? And he said, I'm okay. Now he tried to change it a little bit, and we had to go to his transcript, but he agreed, he said, I'm okay. And then, ski patrollers come by. So, I mean, there it would have to be a pretty vast conspiracy against Deer Valley for this to be a cover-up. And remember, they were already dismissed. Ski patrollers come by. They see some stuff going on. Everyone all right over there? Eric Christensen did not answer that question. Because this is a contact now between injured skier and ski patrol. Eric's a ski instructor. And so, what, ha what, what happened, Eric? He said, they talked. So this isn't, we're not in there like trying to bully someone. Craig spoke to Terry privately. He said, Eric said, I, can, I couldn't hear it. And then, which obviously Terry at some point said, he remembers Terry saying, are you okay? Are you okay? So there's, there's a connection. And then what did they say? We're okay. And the ski patrollers left. All right, so that's what's happening in real time. Now we go to the paperwork. Why don't we, why don't we fill out a big deal, get everyone's statements and everything? Because if this happens all the time on ski resorts, if everyone's okay, okay. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't have a scene about it. But they go down a little longer. They know, now know that, pa, that Ms. Paltrow was part of the collision. And then Terry, and you can believe him, you can believe him, but they now know. I'm not skinned too well. I don't feel that well. All right, fair enough. It did come 10 minutes after they found out who they had been involved with. All right, bring in Whitney. Whitney's an awesome, geez, I, I thought she was a fabulous witness. She pulls up, and her, she's all business. Like, uh, okay, I'm going to assess for unconsciousness. No. What happened? She says, what happened to Terry? He didn't say, I got hit. He says, I don't remember. I don't know. Did Craig immediately go in on that? We'll have to defer to a report. That was a legitimate question of mine. I'm trying to remember. James, when are you up? Five minutes. Are you up in five? I can do that. That gives you five or 10? Gives me 15. Thanks. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be done in five minutes, folks. OK. So Whitney's delightful, loads them up, takes them down, says, hey, before, I want you to remember five things. And this isn't like man, woman, dog. This is like, I got my degree in Michigan, I was Deer Valley Grand Slalom person, whatever. All these really detailed. I like horses, my horse's name, all this stuff. Remember it. Terry says, I remember. I knew I was ha now having a cognition memory test performed upon me. He goes down, and she then says, do you remember? And oh my gosh, he remembered. In fact, he remembered so well, he decided this is a good opportunity for me to text and post a picture of Whitney smiling <coughs> and just talk about how wonderful she is. Whitney, meanwhile, is sitting there trying to figure out, OK, are there any problems here? Are you seeing any signs of concussion? No, I'm not. Uh, do you remember Dr. Edgley? I don't know if you thought that was cool, that a guy who heads up the U's Acquired Brain Injury Clinic has had an acquired brain injury. I thought it was kind of cool. Anyway, he goes, what do you look at? You look at 
a period of unconsciousness. We have Craig versus all these people saying he's not, and he wasn't unconscious. They even imply like Christensen would, didn't even care about us. He's yelling at us, he's bullying us, and then he's abandoning us on the conscious drooling on the mountain. Give me a break. Is that what you know Deer Valley to be? So, uh, so then, okay, he checks out at the, at the uh, main clinic, then he's down to the Instacare. What is that Instacare do, uh, PA looking? He's looking for, no? I don't see any sign, signs of uh, symptoms of uh, unconsciousness or concussion. Because they're looking at memories, they're looking at periods of unconsciousness, and they're looking at, uh, what was the third, do you recall? Memory. Ataxia. Ataxia. Uh, that's, that means inability to speech. I don't think that is what they were looking for. Uh, in any case, they're looking for any signs and the symptoms of uh, uh, a concussion. No. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't have a concussion. But it does mean this is not, this isn't anything severe at all. I mean, OK, next day he goes to the VA. These are the people he knows. CT, guess what? They're, li they're like all the same abnormalities as you had in your brain before. The problem is, and by the way, he then goes for three neuro assessments, and they all say normal, normal to above normal, in some ways, really above normal. So neuro, neuro assessments, those are all his treating providers. Why would we have our experts go do neuro assessments when three separate treating providers that he knows and trusts and that no one's paying say above normal? Why would we do that? But the problem is he then goes to Gibby and Fong, and he just self-reports. Everything was normal beforehand. Wrong. And now everything's terrible. Wrong. He doesn't tell him he's flying all over the world, that he's biking, that he's the poster boy for a fitness at age 75. He's posting every darn thing. I mean, this isn't like me sending out a private investigator and trying to find pictures. All I have to do is put Terry Sanderson. Oh my gosh, the guy's Mr. Activity. Heaven help me if I can be as active as he is at 75. All right, I have one more minute. I'm gonna go back to Lady, Lady Liberty. So we talked about the blindfold, Lady Justice, excuse me. We talked about the blindfold and we talked about uh, the scale, the sword. The sword, we want you to use the sword. This sounds harsh because we're not beheading anyone. The sword is to defend a meritless claim. This is a meritless claim. You don't throw a $3 million bombshell in the courtroom, call her King Kong, and walk away. You shouldn't reward that. And Gwyneth, who could have just paid it out, paid the ransom, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not gonna have someone hurt me and then put me, ask me for a lot of money. I'm not gonna do it, I'm gonna sit here. I said, you're gonna have to sit here for two weeks in Park City, and you can't even look at your phone. And she said, I'm gonna do it. I'm not paying that. We ask you for the dollar, not because she had to go in and get an early massage, but it screwed up a very carefully planned, important part time in her life Thank heavens the family melded well together. But we want our dollar. Thank you for your time. Judge, can we approach briefly? Sure.
Mr. Egan, you may proceed. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Are you guys hearing this? Okay. Okay, so it's my job uh, to talk about Mr. Sanderson's claim that he's not living the life that he used to live and it's Ms. Paltrow's fault. Hope I can be helpful to you. As we walk through some of this, uh, I wanted to start by just pointing to this document. This, you remember, Whitney Smith was the, the uh, ski patroller that arrived and wrote this report that day. A little bit later, uh, Ms. Rollins could not uh, recall a, an important fact. This is the witness section at the bottom is not filled out. Mr. Ramon did not come forward and say, this is what happened. Let me tell you about it. Uh, Whitney Smith would have written that in there if he did. She uh, also pointed to, uh, we also pointed to the fact that she did not write uh, an X at that concussion and head boxes where she could have noted possible injury. She's, uh, to use one of Mr. Sykes' phrases, she has no dog in this fight. She would have put X's there if she was concerned about that. She didn't. You also heard her talk about um, mild disorientation in her um, uh, report. And that shows up here. And I think you've seen that the, um, the plink, gosh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This thing can be finicky. Uh, you've seen it. I'll just move forward for the sake of time. There's those mild disorientation notes, right? And she explained that she didn't see that as uh, indication of concussion. She just saw it as being kind of rattled from a ski collision. And that's relevant to damages because Mr. Sanderson is claiming that he had a concussion and all of the symptoms that have come from the collision relate back to that concussion. I think there's, there's uh, considerable doubt that he even had one. Though he may have, and you could certainly find that, but you might find that he, he didn't have a concussion. Um, I think Though that I want to, I want to kind of frame this in, in a with a certain theme. Maybe you've seen a pattern over the, the course of these last couple weeks or the last two weeks. Um, on the one hand, you have real events, and then on the other hand, you have embellishments. On the one hand, you have objective tests, and on the other hand, you have subjective reports. On the one hand, you have what happened in the past, and then on the other hand, you have perception of what happened in the past. Um, the realities of life, sometimes difficult realities. Um, and on the other hand, you have anxious exaggerations. I think Mr. Ramon took the reality of the collision and spun it into an attention-grabbing story for friends about dramatic injuries and celebrity. He was talking a lot about that. Uh, uh, Ms. Smith overheard it as um, she was caring for Mr. Sanderson. And then there were those comments that we found in the middle of trial where he kind of he talked about it, and you heard him explain that he'd been talking about it with friends. He knew a lot about Ms. Paltrow. He's very interested in this. I think he took that reality of the collision and embellished that what happened, what he saw. And Mr. Sanderson's taken the reality of his aging body, and he's turned it into a profound injustice perpetrated by Ms. Paltrow. It isn't that. The facts show that his health challenges started long before the collision, and they progressed in a predictable way. I think you heard Dr. Hesh yesterday say, if you look at his medical records, you look through the history, you take the, the, the collision out of that timeline, it reads coherently. The prior stuff would predict the next stuff. You don't need the collision to explain what happens afterwards. It's not to say that he didn't have injuries in the collision. Nobody disputes the broken ribs. Um, and those were certainly painful. They did heal. Um, and then the concussion, if he had one, was very brief, as you heard multiple experts say yesterday, and had very mild, mild symptoms that may have even resolved within that day. So even if you find that Ms. Paltrow caused the accident, I think you only have sufficient evidence to find damages that, that relate to those broken ribs and the, the, the concussion that resolved very quickly. Um, this, the slow de degeneration of uh, bodies is hard to accept, and mental health challenges are hard to face. That's, it's obviously human to want a concrete explanation for these difficulties. 
but as the court has instructed you, Mr. Sanderson should not receive the money he asked for if you find that his perceptions do not match reality. The law requires that he convince you that more likely than not, he has suffered real harm that Ms. Paltrow is the, and, and that Ms. Paltrow is the cause of that harm, and he has not done that. Um, through the course of the trial, you've seen uh, that Mr. Sanderson does have genuine problems, and I don't want to minimize that. Uh, experts from both sides have talked about his anxiety and depression and the trouble he's had with family and relationships before and after the accident. Uh, you know, you've seen brain scans. Dr. Black came in here, and he was the only expert, I believe, that took you through all of them and explained how they, you know, were back in 2009, look very similar to what you've seen um, going forward. They're connected to abnormalities related to, to aging and other conditions that might explain his, his problems. Um, but he's, Mr. Sanderson's argued that you should believe his experts because they evaluated him personally. Uh, the problem, I think, with that argument is that, as you've learned these past two weeks, these experts didn't carefully review his medical history, and they relied heavily on his unreliable reports about it. He, they also want you to believe what they've been calling the before and after witnesses, those, the family and the daughters, uh, the, sorry, the daughters, the, uh, the friend, and then the girlfriend. And I think that you've learned these past two weeks that they didn't know Mr. Sanderson's health as well as they thought they did. And uh, he was actually, they had, I think, acknowledged that he's good at hiding some of those issues, maybe totally understandably, um, and reluctant to share his troubles. So you have objective facts and then subjective reports. And the law requires you to find evidence, reality, not just the perception of problems. Um, from our experts, you've heard a consistent, compelling account uh, that Mr. Sanderson uh, had these problems before, that the concussion occurred, potentially, maybe, again, very briefly, if, if at all, and that those conditions that he's experienced afterward that he attributes to Ms. Paltrow are the predictable consequence of that prior history. They were, you, you heard them all yesterday, I guess you had Dr. Edgley the night before, but you heard them all, and it was a coherent, consistent story. I think you got a sense that they've read the records carefully, the objective records of treaters who have, again, no dog in this fight, just re reporting what is going on for many, uh, many, many years before and after the collision. Your Honor, I have till 25? Yes. OK. Five more minutes. I got a lot. I'm not going to get it to all of it, but I'll, again, I'll, I'll try to get to the helpful stuff. Um, Mr. Owens went through the, the various evidence about loss of consciousness um, and the different witnesses that have, um, I, I hope, persuaded you that Mr. Sanderson did not get knocked out for multiple minutes. Um, but Dr. Eastfold gave you some interesting testimony yesterday. She said that the medical records after the accident are actually inconsistent with serious concussion injury. They, there was the cognitive assessments she pointed to that were normal. Uh, there was the balance assessment that was normal. You wouldn't expect it to be normal. And then there was the alcohol intake that actually increased, even though a concussion would reduce your tolerance for alcohol. Again, careful looking at the events in question, which I don't think you heard plaintiff's experts do. Mr. Sanderson's perception is different, obviously. He, not only thinks he was knocked out for minutes, but he, he said he had a profound cognitive trouble during this time um, with Ms. Smith, who said he was cognitively intact, could speak to him. He was writing articulate posts about her, could carry on conversation for hours. So you got careful evaluation on the one hand, and then you have extreme exaggeration on the other. And uh, I, the law requires you to be careful in your evaluation. Um, Mr. Sanderson, sees the time immediately following the collision as a grim period that began a spiral, uh, uh, began spiraling his life out of control. I think he described the bright side before and then the dark side afterward. And uh, I think it's important to recognize that, as, as we've probably told you too many times, a few weeks just prior to this collision, he was reporting some of the symptoms and the concerns he's, he's saying connect to the collision, right? He said he was getting old all of a sudden, he couldn't do things that he used to do, he'd get preoccupied with paperwork and other little things. 
And that's difficult, and I, I don't mean to make light of that kind of reality that, that aging brings upon all of us, but it's important to, that at that time there was no litigation, he's just reporting, and you heard from experts that point to that as a telltale sign of the kinds of things you would expect after the collision um, that he's, he's attributing to Ms. Paltrow. Mr. Sanderson's told you that the collision forced him to be a recluse. And if we had time, I would pull up those pictures. We went through a lot of them, and I hope that wasn't overboard. I, there's, you got a sense of just how much he has done since the collision. Traveled more than some people have traveled in their whole lives. And I, I think it's, it's that this $3 million, I don't know where the board is, $3 million claim, I think doesn't acknowledge that reality. Mr. Sanderson is better than he realizes that he is. And it's not that he doesn't have problems, it's just that he is better than he realizes he is, and it's, it's hard for him to accept some of the, the decline that he's experienced. Um, and he's, again, uh, grabbed onto this collision as, as an, uh, uh, an explanation for it. Um, you've heard from Dr. Hesh and Dr. Edgley about how litigation contributes to problems like he's had, and you heard even from his own expert, Dr. Goldstein, that he's obsessed with this, this case and it's not good for him, that, that moving on would be uh, um, helpful for him. And, uh, and I think that it, we, we all want resolution to this case. Mr. Sanderson's asking to be compensated for a ski injury that the evidence shows that he himself caused. And the evidence also shows that his life is not the mess he perceives it to be. Ms. Paltrow wants him off the mountain too, but she should not be responsible for the cost of that. And so uh, we leave you with that argument. Hope that you can, hope, of course, hope you're persuaded and thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Mr. Sorensen. Thank you for being here. Oh, Pete, I have oh. this. Thank you for that. Here. We appreciate the time and attention that you've spent with us the last couple of weeks going on kind of this journey. There's been a lot of fanfare, a lot of hubbub about this. You've seen a lot of technology. Some has failed, as we've seen today, but some has worked. Um, and through all of that, I want to remind you of uh, jury instruction number 24, okay? And it says, when the lawyers are giving their closing arguments, keep in mind that they are advocating their views of the case. What they say during closing arguments is not evidence. If the lawyers say anything about the evidence that conflicts with what you remember, you are to rely on your memory of the evidence. If they say anything about the law that conflicts with, the, with these instructions, you are to rely on these instructions. Now you've heard some pretty amazing narratives, a spin on the facts from, and you could probably say it cuts both ways, both sides. But I want you to remember about this case that there are two stories here. One is Gwyneth Paltrow, and you've heard her, her defense attorneys lay out her case. You've heard her side of the story. But there's also another side, and that is Terry Sanderson. They've done a really good job of telling you about what Craig Ramon says about how he describes this whole thing happened. And what Gwyneth Paltrow says, or what Eric Christensen says. But the two stories that are important to remember are Terry Sanderson's and Gwyneth Paltrow's. Terry remembers skiing down the mountain, hearing a scream directly behind him, and then bam, as he put it, lights out, okay? He's knocked unconscious. He's left on the mountain, figuratively, uh, as we've talked about, F trying to figure out what's going on. When he comes to, it's, it's chaos. He doesn't really understand what's going on. On the other hand, we have Gwyneth Paltrow, who says that she's skiing along, and, and all of a sudden, she gets hit from behind. It's up to you now to weigh that evidence to see what you remember, what you recall, not the way that the attorneys characterize the evidence, but what you see in the record. 
And I will tell you that what you see in the record corroborates the story of Terry Sanderson. Terry Sanderson, I just walked you through his tale of what happened, okay? His versions of facts that happened. When he's hit from behind, he has to rely on the one person, remember that, the one person that says that they saw the actual collision and saw what happened. He has to rely on that. But it doesn't mean that it's not part of his story. It means that he's relying on an eyewitness that corroborates what he said. Also, we have the, the meetup group post that's been talked a lot about and the comments to that post. That's contemporaneous evidence the day of that corroborates the story that these two have shared with you. It says, and Craig Ramon's own words says, it scared the hell out of me. It scared him. It scared what he, he was scared. So that might be an account that you weigh as to why he didn't step in to try to give life-saving or, or life-supporting measures to his friend. He's scared. He doesn't know what's happening. And the person that he's relying on to take charge of the situation comes over and starts screaming at him. It's also important to remember that Brad Falchuk, who we didn't get a chance to hear from, and Carrie Oaks both contradict in major ways uh, his story. He cannot reference the testimony of Brad Falchuk. He admitted, Your Honor, and that was just, a stipulation. Just a minute. Um, he admitted, Your Honor, that he did not see it. Your Honor, that testimony that was just, not just to evidence. Just to admit, yeah, that's true. That was, that was a stipulated fact. That was a stipulated fact. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Brad Falchuk did not see it. Okay. Eric Christensen, in his own reporting, didn't see the collision. But yet, right afterwards, he injects himself into this chaotic event and according to him, takes control. He has enough time. Think about this when you're weighing believability of testimony, okay? Eric Christensen has enough time and is all aware about the students that he's being paid to watch and to teach how to ski that are beginner students. <coughs> watch what someone's doing on the other side of the run at the same time with, as reported in the facts show, Many people skiing on this run, it's a converging run that goes down to the, the bottom of the run where people can go and have lunch. He has the ability to pay attention to a, a young child who he's teaching, someone across the way, someone skiing supposedly out of control, and keep track of all this. He hears a scream and looks over and sees, as the animations that you've seen, sees him laying on the ground, or sees these two people laying on the ground. He then has enough time to be the first on the scene, supposedly, after telling Carrie Oaks, take care of the kids, watch them, because I got to go over and take care of this. And he does that all in just fractions of a second. Is that believable? I'll leave that to you to decide. I know the way I feel about it. So this witness, who the defense has said, this grandfatherly, who's this perfect witness, is not really that perfect. And again, I'll leave that for you to decide. Now, a lot's been made of what Terry Sanderson was saying or doing after the incident, right? We have, we've, you've heard, and I don't want your eyes to glaze over. That's why I'm not using any of the, the props. I'm just talking to you. But, You've heard a lot about this email, right? The email Terry Sanderson sent later that night, or the first email and the response back, okay? And I want you to remember this. The GoPro incident, or the GoPro video, I guess, and we'll talk about this GoPro email, is a response from his daughter, who sat here and testified. Three weeks before she'd been in, she'd been in her own ski accident, she was laying there with her leg up, she was under, as I think she said, she had pain pills at the time. She was aching an injury. And there might have been kids coming in and out of her room. She didn't remember exactly why she wrote what she wrote. <coughs> Nonetheless, she admits that she wrote it. And she said here in front of you that it was clearly a misunderstanding that something her dad might have said 
when he was on the phone with her. That's the shred of evidence that they want you to, to cling on to to try to say that Terry Sanderson did something like destroy a video of this event. That's our only piece of evidence that they put on in front of you to that fact. Now, again, there are many contradictions in this tall tale and the cartoons you've been forced to watch a few times. And I want you to remember, OK, there was testimony that Brad Falchuk was on the mountain, but he's not in their videos. He's not in their animations. OK, you didn't see it? But there's testimony that he was right up there close. They left him out. They left out Carrie Oaks and her testimony. We had to read it in because she also contradicts the positions of the bodies after the incident. So they've done a really good job of trying to razzle-dazzle and trying to get you to look at a lot of other things that are not important. Because we told you in the very beginning, when Lawrence Bueller stood up here, you'd hear a lot of so what. That's what they're saying about Terry Sanderson's injuries. So what? He was injured before. His injuries carried through. So what? So sorry he's left on the mountain. We'd like him off. So what? That's what you're hearing. Now, we have shown facts that are corroborated by his medical records that show that from the day after this incident happened, there was a very serious decline. The people that knew him best testified on, under oath in front of all of us as to the changes that they experienced with Terry. His closest family members have seen those relationships affected. Terry's seen it affected. Again, I want you to weigh this evidence in the way that only you can. And I think that you can do it. I've seen all of you be very attentive. I've seen all of you pay attention. And we appreciate that. Because this is a very real situation for two people, the two stories that are at play in this. <clears throat> I also want you to remember, there's been a lot of talk about what Jenny Sanderson said, what Jenny Sanderson reports. But she's the one that went on one of those international trips with him. So it can't be too strained of a relationship. You're not getting the full picture when you have excerpts taken out of context from a deposition that are read to you. You're not. He has three daughters. They all love him. And they all said that. Unfortunately, we didn't get the chance to hear some of the positives from Jenny. But their relationship is strong. She loves her dad. And he loves her. But she even said she's seen changes. Now, yesterday you heard Terry Sanderson say, it's a hard thing to bring a lawsuit against the celebrity. He said, they destroy your life. And they turned around and said, it's your fault. It's your fault that this happened. Your Honor, the, uh, I, I object and would like a little uh, conference, unless you want me to state my objection right here. I think just overruled, and Slepper you can make a record later, but let's let him finish. Thank you. I they don't want her lumped in with Harry other Sanderson. celebrities. Thank you, Judge. Thanks. They point the finger at Terry Sanderson, saying, it's your fault. You did this. You brought this on yourself. Terry Sanderson believes in justice, just like you've seen right here. It's been waved all over. And he wants the weighing of the scales, the same way that Ms. Paltrow does. But Terry Sanderson believes, and I think we've shown you, that on those scales, someone has facts that are weighing, and someone has a lot of fanfare that when you really pry it, it's a so what. It's nothing. So I charge you, and we thank you again for your time, hearing the evidence, listening to all of us, listening to the coughing, listening to the objections, listening to this, sitting through the sidebars. We thank you, but now it's you, it's on you. And we invite you now to weigh the evidence and we empower you and trust that you will weigh this evidence the way you've heard it properly and find on behalf of Terry Sanderson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sorensen. In a civil case, only eight jurors are allowed to deliberate and reach a verdict. Because this trial was scheduled to last over this two-week period, um, and because 
jurors may need to be excused because of an emergency or other extraordinary circumstances, two alternate jurors were selected in this case. Prior to going back and deliberating, the court is required to excuse the alternate jurors. Some jurors are relieved when they are excused prior to deliberations, but most are disappointed and even frustrated that they've invested their time and energy in the trial, but are not going to be able to deliberate. Those of you who are excused, those two, thank you for your service on the jury. Remember um, that you're actually not being, you're not being released as a juror until the verdict comes in. Because there is an outside chance that one of the eight during deliberations may be called away for an emergency. And so the two of you that are allowed to leave, what, you may be called back to finish the deliberations and to vote on the verdict form with the others. So please do not discuss the case with anyone. Please do not read anything about the case. Just keep the existing uh, restrictions in place until notice, uh, further notice by the court, uh, which will be after the verdict is rendered. Please leave your cell phone number with the bailiff so that they can notify you when the verdict has come in and, and even give you the results if you'd like. Again, we, we appreciate your time and attention on this case. So those of, I've got in here all of your names, and I'm just going to look the other way and pick two out, or your juror numbers, rather. And so the two that are excused are number 15 and number 24. Those of you who are not being excused right now, you've been given all of the evidence and instructions on the law regarding this case. Before you retire to, de to deliberate, I need to give you a few final instructions. First about questions. As you deliberate, you may be tempted to seek more information. If you do not have, if, or if you do have questions, please write a note and give it to the bailiff. And I will review that note and the question that you have that pertain to the case and I'll review it with the lawyers and decide on how to answer your, your question, if it's appropriate. However, it's quite possible, and in fact, it's probable that we will not be able to answer your question. You should understand that no further evidence can be provided to you and the instructions given to you contain the law which you need to reach a verdict based on the evidence presented to you. What to take into the jury room? Let me first say that you cannot take your cell phone uh, and you can't have any outside contact during deliberations. So the bailiffs will give you some time before you begin deliberations to text or call anyone and let them know, hey, I'm about to go on a black, you know, be blacked out here uh, while we're deliberating. And then they'll take all of your cell phones and they'll keep them in a safe place back by your deliberation room. You may take the following things in there with you. Your notes that you took the jury instructions and any notes you took on those jury instructions. All of the exhibits admitted into evidence. They are being assembled. The lawyers will agree that, yes, we do have the, this is the correct exhibits with the clerk, and then they'll be brought back to you in a little bit. Um, you're also, the same, same with the verdict form. I have the original verdict form. It says original on top. This is the one that will be filled out, and the bailiff will bring this back to you as well. When you get to the jury room, please do the following before beginning your deliberations. Read over the instruction on selecting a foreperson and select a foreperson, and then you may begin. At this time, I'd like the clerk to administer the oath to the bailiffs. that you will take charge of this jury and take them to some private and convenient place where they may deliberate upon their verdict, allowing no one to speak to them nor to do so yourself unless so ordered by the court, and to return them to the court when they have reached a verdict or when so ordered. So help you God. Thank you. You may now take the jury back. Thank you.
may be seated. Thank you, Council. Um, Mr. Owens, did you need to make a record on anything on that last objection? Mm, yes, thanks. There was just a reference. It's, it's hard to sue a celebrity. I thought that was an unfair statement given uh, it's, it's this person. This is a person here, not a celebrity. And I thought it was unfair to sort of slime her with Hollywood. And the court anticipated that and, uh, and noted I was, what I was thinking about was the fact that the plaintiff basically said the same thing on the stand, and I think he was just repeating that. So as far as, um, well, are there any exceptions that need to be taken on the record otherwise? Okay. I wonder if uh, there's been a motion filed by some members of the press concerning how to handle the reading of the verdict. Mr. Raymond, are you in the courtroom? Mr. Hunt. Yes. Mr. Hunt, is that right? Yes. Why don't you come up and present your motion? If you could first uh, identify yourself, your bar number, and then who, who it is you're representing. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jeff Hunt. My bar number is 5855. I represent Court TV, ABC News, CNN, Daily Mail, the Associated Press, and NBC News. Okay. I'm ready to hear your motion. We did file a motion, Your Honor, to modify the court's um, electronic media coverage order and decorum order, uh, which previously through the trial has restricted uh, EMC coverage of council tables. And as the court knows, <clears throat> this is a case that's attracted substantial national and international attention. I think it's actually been a marvelous opportunity for the public to observe how the court reaches decisions, how cases are litigated, and <clears throat> we all benefit from that. That transparency, that accountability, that is what the EMC rule that was adopted by the Supreme Court was intended to serve. And as your honor knows, under the EMC rule, rule 4.401, electronic media coverage is presumed um, within the limitations of the rule. And in sub subsection six of the rule, there are several limitations for not showing the jurors, not showing minors, not showing exhibits that haven't been admitted, et cetera. Council's table is not within subsection six. So as the rule stands, the presumption is that there should be electronic media coverage of counsel's table. And we just simply wanted to clarify for the court that when the jury comes in and announces their verdict, that the videographer and the still photographer for the Associated Press be allowed to show the public, as everybody here in the courtroom would see, counsel's table. I mean, that is the most important part of the trial. This is what we've all been leading up to. Everybody here in the courtroom will be able to observe counsel and the parties when that verdict is announced. And we simply believe that consistent with the rule, unless there is an overwhelming, and the rule says a compelling interest, not to show uh, the parties and the lawyers during the announcement, that it should be allowed and the court should modify uh, the order to allow still camera photography, and the video coverage. We've participated with Court TV uh, in over 30 years of trials, live coverage. We've never had once uh, a situation where the, the public wasn't allowed to observe the parties and the council uh, when the verdict was announced. And that's for good reason. Uh, you've had seven years of litigation, as I understand it. You've had two weeks of trial, and the, the most important people, the people that have the most interest in the outcome of this litigation is the parties and their counsel. And the public ought to be able to observe them uh, when, the, when the verdict is announced. And again, under the rule, Your Honor, the burden is on the party seeking to impose an, an additional limitation um, under the EMC rule to come forward with some 
uh, explanation for why that would be particularly harmful um, or prejudicial. And there simply isn't any, any reason for that. Uh, if you look at uh, the reasons, the, the factors that are in the rule, all those factors weigh in favor, uh, fa weigh in favor of allowing uh, EMC coverage of the verdi verdict announcement. Envision this happening physically. Um, I'm not sure where Wes would like to be positioned, the still photographer. I imagine yes, there would be a still camera right here. Okay. But without an operator, that is be remote. Is that possible? I'm not sure if that works for still, but the video would just be as the video would normally work. Right. Uh, for but the, for the the still. Yeah, there was a still camera up here before Mr. Hunt, but I don't, I don't know how much control the photographer had over that camera, and it had a very big, long lens, and it was focused on one individual. He says he could fire it remotely from that position, the but, camera. But can they? I mean, if it's the aperture. Well, I'm just wondering uh, if it would be if the if it would be focused on. If it would be if the if it would be focused on one individual or be focused on both council tables at once, I mean, how how do you foresee that? Well, today I don't have the, the ability to set this thing up to assist, but I'm looking to see what it does. Okay. So at this point, physically, what it would require is a photographer to be standing over here and taking pictures. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. I don't okay. Have Okay. And um, I mean, the court TV camera is very unobtrusive. I don't see it. I don't hear it. It's a, it can pan and move and, uh, and do all sorts of things without anyone noticing it. I realize that right now, um, I mean, this will be the end of the case. So the, the, the concern of, of an interruption of the proceeding is different, but it's still there in terms of decorum. Um, how how can we maintain court decorum and still meet the request? It is there, Your Honor, but uh, we can station the photographer there in a place that's unobtrusive. The jury's here. The focus is going to be here. It's going to be very brief. It's not like we're asking. And, and why can't why can't the still photographer take stills off of the court TV feed? I'm not. The quality's not going to be there. Uh, they're just different. I'll hear, from, I'll hear from both sides. Yeah, just they're just minute. different modes of, of, ca of, of capturing the image. St the and still photographer is just set up, designed just for that. The images are richer. And in your experience or your client's experience, how have other courts handled the still photographer? We've t usually had the still photographer positioned in a place that's unobtrusive um, and for limited periods of time and not able to go in and out of the courtroom. It's just there. Thank you. If Thank you, if you I'm, I'll hear from you in again, but I just want to hear from the party. Sure. Mr. Sykes? Your Honor, on behalf of the plaintiff, we have no objection to this. We think it's reasonable. Uh, <coughs> right now, there's uh, uh, this tripod over here with the camera on it is covered with a, kind of a black robe, like uh, two judicial black robes here. And I think if Mr. Uh, uh, Bomber was to stand there, and we'll, we'll take the screen down. I, I think that would be fine for us. We don't think that would be obtrusive or violate decorum. So we're in favor of it. Thank you. Mr. Owens? Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, First Amendment's important to us. There's a, certainly been a public benefit, I think, to having this uh, in the public sphere. There, we've noted three violations of the decorum order. The very first day my client walked into the court, after I assured her there would be no photographers in the lobby, 
There was one right in her face as she went through security. Then suddenly one day a, another camera appeared and then a third violation we felt. I don't know if you found a violation, but I have still photos of her being taken just uh, yesterday. So we're all for the First Amendment. The idea that the public should see what we see, the public isn't seated in the well of the court. The public is seated behind Ms. Ms. Paltrow. The jurors have an interest here. This is stressful for jurors to have a still photographer standing right where that screen is as the ph those folks come in. I think even if their picture isn't taken, I think it's strange. I think it will be stressful. Mr. Sanderson actually has a privacy interest here too. I thought it was insightful of your honor to ask about how this would physically change. If nothing would physically change, and if they're looking uh, at the defense counsel in its totality, defense counsel's table, um, we would have no objection. Mr. Hunt? So the defense wouldn't have any objection if nothing changes physically in the courtroom from the way it sits right now? That, that's fine, but I, I still think it would be unobtrusive and completely consistent with court decorum to have the still photographer there for the minute or two that it took to announce the verdict. It's not going to, they'll have already determined their verdict. It's not gonna add any additional stress. They have known that there's been media coverage throughout the trial. We disagree that there's been any violation of the decorum order. Counsel has not approached me about that. We're not. I, you, but I, don't, I didn't even know you existed in this case until an hour ago. I only represented the media in Utah for 30 years. <laughs> yeah. I know you, but I didn't know you were even involved in this case. So we're not here about that. We're here about my motion. And it sounds like we squared away the, the court TV, the video. We dash your honor for the two minutes, unobtrusive. Mr. Sykes makes a good suggestion of moving uh, the, the uh, the stand up and we think that that can be accomplished and and the, the public will be richer for it we're going to have descriptions about the reaction anyway the, the the press is going to report that so why not have the images and the video that actually show what the reaction is so the pu public can judge for itself what the reaction is that's the most accurate way to report this to the public thank you thank you well, given the fact that there is a presumption um, in the rule and the, given the First Amendment, the court will grant the request as long as, for the reasons stated, for as long as that, uh, that is used to sort of stand between the photographer, the still photographer, and the jury. So we can turn that sideways. The still photographer can stand quietly. And I assume your camera makes no noise? No, sir. There's no flash? No, sir. Okay. You can stand next to the uh, the existing camera then, and uh, when the when the uh, verdict is read. Thank you. All right. Is there anything else uh, before we adjourn at this time? Uh, can I throw out an issue that uh, will need to be addressed at some point? Uh, Your Honor has had a protective order in place um, in terms of speaking with the press. Um, after the verdict is delivered, is that protective order lifted as to speaking to the press or issuing press releases? I ask because we've received a lot of inquiries. I think the protective order and the decorum order, I think, talk about the evidence, for instance, depositions being held confidential in perpetuity. Um, but the press issue, I think, is appropriately lifted once the, d the verdict is delivered. So there you go. I, I don't quite understand your request, your, sure. your clarification. Are you, so you're ask, are you asking to uh, continue the protective order, or are you asking for confirmation that the protective order will be released? As to the press 
as to the press. We want it to be released. We don't want certain, for instance, depositions that were taken that were marked confidential. Anything that was not, for instance, I have boxes and boxes of things that didn't come into trial. Right. I don't want that. I want those held. Everything uh, that was marked confidential according to this court's confidentiality order remains confidential. Correct. In perpetuity. If it's been entered into evidence in this court, it's obviously not then confidential. Then it becomes public. And then uh, we do want you, we, t we do want to be able to speak to the press after the verdict. You, you may. Uh, do you have any objection to that, Mr. Sykes? No. Okay. So, so once the verdict is read, um, the, the, the informal agreement between the sides that they won't talk to the press until after the case, that's then no longer there and, and they can talk to the press. And the press can talk to witnesses, the press can talk to uh, jurors if they so desire, and I'll explain that to the jury, and I'm going to ask the press to please um, uh, acknowledge and respect the wishes of the witnesses and respect the witnesses or the uh, request uh, wishes of the jurors. And if they don't want to t to speak to them, or if they want to wait, or maybe later, please respect that. So I expect I expect that that'll happen. Pete just mentioned uh, the decorum order prohibits any cameras in the courthouse. I think that should be lifted now, I mean, uh, because it's cold out there and wet out there, and they shouldn't have to be out there, and we shouldn't have to go out there to talk to the press if we want to. Well, I'll consider that, but it's it, um, the reason that there's the standing order that there not be press doing things uh, other than inside the walls of the courthouse, other than through the through a decorum order, is because, or special orders is for other reasons. There's security reasons, things like that. So um, I'll, I'll talk with those that have some control over that and get back to you on that. Anything else before we adjourn? Not, f not finally adjourn, but take a recess? Okay, so what, what I'm going to do is when I'm uh, alerted that there is a verdict, I will let the head of security operations, uh, Chris Palmer, know that that's happened. And he will then let all the press know that in approximately 20 minutes or longer if we need, need that, at least we'll wait at least 20 minutes before we bring the jury in and read the verdict. So if the lawyers will please leave a cell phone number contact with Jody, then we'll have, uh, we, we'll call you as well if you're not on premise. All right, thank you. We're in recess.